Dire Wave. Three. Our anthropology is not derived by human psychology or you know empirical data from MIT or something like this. It's derived from the revealed aspect of, of what we see in Christology. And so there's no real way to diagnose man's problem and to understand man and man's anthropology, as I said, without the, the right theology. Logos is the icon of the Father, and man is the icon of God. We are the image of God. Dire wave. Three.
Dire Wave 3. Dire Wave 3.
Dire Wave. Three. What's up, nerds? How y'all doing? Somebody said I'd have a bigger audience if I didn't call people nerds. I didn't start that. I don't even know where it came from. But hey, I'm chalked up. I'm ready to go, baby. And, uh, you know, debating can be annoying. It can get old, but it can also be fun. It has its pros. It has its cons. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to wanted to have a good uh, conversation with Trent for a long time. So I think tomorrow is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we got uh, a lot of cool stuff that we're going to be bringing to the table. Uh, got gigantic tables of papers spread everywhere. Uh, so somebody said, I hope you're prepared, dude. Hope you're prepared. I've been preparing for over a month, so I'm well prepared. And um, not to be arrogant, but I mean, it is a topic that we've debated for uh, 20 years. I mean, I've been in the camp of criticism of this position even back when I was in undergrad. So um, don't think that I'm treating it uh, as some sort of... Um, Willy nilly thing, uh, as as everybody knows, we've reviewed Trent in the past. I think Trent is a excellent debater. I have a lot of respect for Trent. Um, we did a long review of his uh, review of his debate with uh, Cosmic Skeptic, and of course we gave him uh, props because you know he did really well in that debate. That was pretty much an evisceration. Now this is a little different because I don't this is more of an evidentialist, you know, attitude towards debate. Not that there's anything wrong with evidences, right? Evidences themselves aren't problematic. Uh, you do have to use evidences in debate, but this is a little different because it's not a debate about, uh, apologetic methodologies. So w one kind of a uh, misunderstanding we probably should dispel is the idea that if you're a presuppositionalist or if you use a transcendental argument, you don't believe in evidences. You're, you're against evidences. Totally not true. Uh, evidences uh, come into play all the time. And in fact, there's nothing but evidence for Christianity. That's precisely the point of uh, presuppositionalism is that it's the most uh, extreme evidentialist position that you could have because there's nothing but evidence for Christianity. So... Uh, tomorrow's debate is going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Uh, I meant to put the address for this debate in the show description. So I'm going to add that real quick. Uh, put it down the bottom. Now, I'm a little iffy about playing this debate because... If I play the video, I don't trust that Matt Frad isn't going to try to strike my channel. <laughs> so I have it ready to go, but I mean, Matt Frad doesn't like us at all, which is fine. And I just think he might use that as a reason to, you know, try to try to do a little nasty business, try to do a little sump sump, try to be a little sass. So. I'm going to play the audio, at least. Uh, but we just don't know, right? We just don't know. You can't... It would be nice if we could, uh, you know, speak freely. And really, technically, under fair use. It would come under fair use. And I don't think I would lose if we had to dispute that. But it's not even worth really risking it going into that because, you know... I think we're a lot safer if we just play and refute the audio. Uh, it's just, you know, Trent's face and Matt's face anyway. So it's not like you're missing, you know, beautiful scenery. And, if you're, uh, you know, unless you really want to see, you know, the glare on Matt's head. Uh, we're not really missing much. But as you know, uh, we've been researching a lot. In preparation for this debate, I just swallowed a, a ginger chew. Hold on one second. 
And uh, shout out to uh, our good buddy, Nor- uh, Father Deacon Ananias, Norwegian News. Uh, of course, he, uh, as a specialist in epistemology, you know, he knows a lot of the current debate trajectories. So actually not in the, I mean, not in the last uh, month, but in the last year, Father Deacon has really recommended a whole bunch of really useful books. Shout out to Space Jockey, Energetic Procession. He's also recommended some really good materials and uh, essays relating to some of these topics. So, you know, we have a, a, ho- a whole host of people that really contribute. So I don't want to make it out like, oh, I'm just some one person thing that, you know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, Trent has uh, Catholic answers. So, you know, he has people that I'm sure he works with as well. And he comes out of the Steubenville milieu and you know there's uh, various uni eight professors and people that work at Steubenville so you know that's just part of it and yeah we want to we want to give our proper props you know shout out to the peeps the props and uh you know I'm not gonna this the purpose of this review is not to you know lay out all of our cards you know we're not gonna show all of our cards and points and arguments that we're gonna bring to the table tomorrow so you know if you came thinking that you would uh, figure out what I'm gonna do and oh I'll know what he's I'll know I'll see his hand beforehand not gonna happen uh, that's not gonna work uh we're gonna do another fun review like we always do um when we analyze debates and it's one of the funnest things they get a lot of views everybody loves these i always say do them uh over and over and over and i didn't even i re- i forgot this debate uh not because i don't care for the people I, I like to watch these people debate but i remembered lewis had clipped the clip from this debate right and made a video that was really funny that kind of showed where Matt really messes up in this debate. <laughs> and uh, then I remembered, I never actually watched this debate. I just watched Lewis's eight minute video. <laughs> so uh, it was high time to actually watch the debate. So let's get this started. Um, I imagine we'll get through a good bit of it. We may not do the whole two, two hours and 11 minutes. But if I recall, there's some pretty significant um philosophical blunders on Matt's part in this debate. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Everything good? Sound good? And as you know, we're going to have to make sure, let's make sure the sound is good when I play this debate. I'm going to let it play a little bit. Uh, Mate Fraid. Mate's just giving his introduction. So let it's me know if whenever. you can hear this. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Matt for hosting this debate. I'm grateful for the other Matt for participating in it. Tonight, I'm going to defend the statement that it's reasonable to believe Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. Can you hear that? Matt has the burden of defending the negative, that it's not reasonable to believe Jesus rose from the dead. In order for each of us to defend our positions, we each have to present a standard for what makes a belief reasonable, especially belief in unusual, unrepeatable events. However, being reasonable is not the same as being convincing. You could fail to be convinced by a belief, uh, but still think that the belief is reasonable. For example, Matt, Matt is not convinced of Alex O'Connor's ethical veganism, but I doubt Matt would say Alex is unreasonable for being an ethical vegan. Likewise, Matt's personal doubts about the resurrection are irrelevant to whether belief in the resurrection is reasonable. Instead, Matt has to defend an objective standard for what makes beliefs reasonable or... Now, this is a great point. I like where Trent has gone here, and it's precisely the approach that I would go if I was debating Matt, right? And when we did the debate with Matt, we kind of started out in this this arena where we wanted to go to Matt's presuppositions. Of course, that doesn't mean that Trent is a presuppositionalist. I'm not saying that. But um, I like that he's going to the epistemic question and he's saying, well, first of all, Matt, we've got to understand that just uh, not being convinced, your uh, psychological state of being unconvinced does not mean that a position is necessarily unreasonable for the very fact that we could find all kinds of positions that uh, you disagree with, but that you still don't think are unreasonable. So it sounds like Trent's going in the direction of, uh, like he said, he's going to try to pin Matt into giving an account of, well, then what is the criteria for something being reasonable in Matt's worldview? But I don't, I don't know for sure. Let's see what Matt's, what, what he does. Unreasonable. So let me offer three tests to see if belief in an unusual event is reasonable. Number one, 
does the belief contradict well-established facts about the subject in question? If it does, then the belief is unreasonable. For example, the claim that everyone buried in Arlington National Cemetery physically rose from the dead would be unreasonable because it contradicts the facts about those bodies still being in the ground. But claiming Jesus rose from the dead doesn't contradict any similar fact about Jesus remaining in his tomb. Now, you might say the science of biology shows dead people stay dead, and so the resurrection contradicts this fact. But this isn't a fact about Jesus, it's a fact about human beings in general. Atheists like Matt are often skeptical of universal statements like everything that begins to exist has a cause. So why not be skeptical of statements like human beings never come back from the dead when we are presented with a reasonable counterexample? Moreover, the claim that Jesus miraculously rose from the dead requires that dead people stay dead. That's because a miracle is a supernatural intervention that serves as a sign of God's revelation. Just as an orange life vest is a sign of a survivor in the ocean, because it's so unlike the surrounding blue water, the resurrection can only be a sign from God or a miracle if it was so unlike our usual experience of people dying and remaining dead. But does this mean we have to accept every miracle claim that doesn't contradict a fact about the subject in question? No. Here's test number two. Is there a lack of evidence we would expect if the event did occur? If there is, then it's unreasonable to believe the event occurred. For example, it's unreasonable to believe Jesus appeared to every person in ancient Rome after his crucifixion because ancient historians would have written about that. But suppose Jesus really did rise from the dead and appeared to Peter, the 12 disciples, James, Paul, 500 others, as recorded in 1 Corinthians 15. What kind of evidence would we expect to emerge after these events? The people to whom Jesus appeared would tell other people about what happened. Some people would believe these disciples and some wouldn't. This process of oral communication would result in the establishment of communities of believers, or churches. The tiny minority of believers who were literate might write about the resurrection, and non-Christian... I liked where this began. Uh, now I, I kind of think it's getting into the domain of weak stuff. Like, he had a great point at the beginning. I, I wish he had. Maybe he will later on. I don't know. But he could have really uh, pursued this line of argument about uh, Matt's criteria of reasonableness and uh, rationality itself. What is reason? Um, and But now he's saying, well... If Jesus raised from the dead, then some of the things that we might expect would be what happened in Christian history. There would be churches, there would be apostles, this kind of stuff. I don't find that to be a very convincing line of argumentation, not because it isn't what's in history, but that's the Christian paradigm reading of history. And if Matt is a sophisticated atheist, hopefully he will call that out. Uh, don't I don't expect that, but we'll see historians who are aware of this group might reference their beliefs but not accept them. And that is exactly what happened with early Christianity. Now, I'm not saying this proves the resurrection happened. I'm only saying that if Jesus rose from the dead as the New Testament describes, then there is no absence of expected evidence that makes this particular re So, there's no absence of expected evidence. And so, because this happened it's evidence that there might have been a resurrection but it doesn't prove it this is again kind of really hitting at the weakness of starting things with an evidentialist bent right i mean if we're going to prove the resurrection uh we're not going to be able to prove it apart from a paradigm that gives an account for proofs themselves and so it's really just begging the question to pile up all these supposed evidences and then say that that maybe this possibly might likely perhaps suggest that there was a resurrection. But I mean, Matt isn't going to merely accept Christianity if there's a resurrection. I mean, there's Old Testament people who were resurrected, and that doesn't prove Judaism. There are religious claims all over the world about resurrections, and even if the resurrection happened, uh, none of those things actually establish the truth of the religion as a whole that's why christianity is a paradigm it's a whole system of beliefs it's not a piecemeal thing that you pick and choose from you would only think it's a piecemeal thing that you pick and choose from if you have a thomistic evidentialist bent but again if matt is competent and coherent in for let's say accepting the doctrine of uh, one guy resurrecting Maybe he starts his own cult about one guy who resurrects, right? Maybe he thinks Jesus resurrected and 
that now gives him the impetus to start a the Matt cult of Jesus. I mean, isn't this what every cult and sect does? So this whole idea that just merely proving that or arguing that the resurrection is reasonable is not good in terms of proving Christianity. Because Christianity is not a piece-by-piece piece thing that you stack up. It's a whole set of beliefs. And the Trinity is just as necessary as the resurrection. Creation ex nihilo is just as necessary as the doctrine of the resurrection. The virgin birth is just as necessary as the inspiration of the scriptures. They all go together, uh, and it's a set of beliefs. And there's not a piecemeal thing by which you uh, assume uh, that one doctrine is more self-evident than the other doctrines direction belief unreasonable. But an unusual belief could still be unreasonable even if it passes these two tests, which brings us to the final test. Is the evidence for the unusual event just as easily accounted for by a usual... Ex and I would add too, and I think Father Deacon would probably agree with this uh, critique, which is that this approach from the outset kind of already assumes a theory neutral uh, 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 look at evidence and proving things. And so Trent's whole approach is assuming that evidence and proving things isn't theory laden as if you can do that apart from the system of your other beliefs that you have, right? There's not a theory neutral notion of proof and evidence. I mean, by the mere fact that you can convince atheists of all kinds of things and they don't accept the rest of the doctrines of Christianity, even if Matt agrees that you know, it maybe it is reasonable that Christ was raised from the dead. Um, there's a whole host of other sects that he could choose. There's a whole host, host of other false religions, or again, his own cult that he could make up. So when you grant from the outset that Matt as an atheist has the correct paradigm of interpreting the evidences, you're already surrendering the very thing that's in question, which is Matt's whole paradigm of atheism and autonomous reasoning. And so that's, again, the problem with this approach is that it grants too much to the unbeliever to say that he can properly interpret all this, all these domains of the natural world. Um, and if we can get him to agree to enough things, then later down the road, we can just tack on something else. I mean, I like to say that natural theology and evidentialism is like, let me convince you of a bunch of heresies and then down the road, I'll make you a Christian, right? I mean, if we took, for example, Phaser's approach where... Phaser says, okay, I've given up um, trying to argue for creation ex nihilo. Let me just argue for an eternal first actualizer. Okay, so when you convince me of that, you're not making me a Christian. Okay, you're making me a stupid heretic. So do you want to convince me of 20 heresies and then a year from now, five years from now, get me to become a Roman Catholic? Is that, is that the, what you think apologetics is? I mean, does Paul do that in Acts? No, they go out and preach the resurrection, right? They don't, nobody does in the, in the New Testament when the apostles go out and preach. Does anybody do this table of evidences and all this kind of, no, they don't do that. They don't say, well, that's maybe probably partly kind of reasonable to believe that maybe a guy rose from the, no, they don't do that. They say, your wisdom is foolishness, repent and believe in the resurrection. Because you, you can't interpret anything right. If it is, then it is unreasonable to believe in the unusual event. The claim that the Muslim prophet Muhammad received poetic recitations from an angel doesn't necessarily contradict anything about Muhammad. And if an angel only dictated the story in medieval Arabic conventions, we'd expect the Quran to sound as it does. But test number three says there are usual explanations that account for these historical facts. This includes fraud or even mistakenly attributing one's subconscious thoughts to the voice of God or an angel. Therefore, it's not reasonable to believe in the central miracle of Islam, but the central miracle of Christianity. So, I mean, again, the, this whole line of argumentation acts as if there's a common notion of what's reasonable. But what's in debate is the, are the very things that are prior to reason. Do these people not get this? Do the evidentialists and the, and the natural theologian proponents not understand that actually what's in debate is not a conclusion of a syllogism or a bunch of argumentation, some God, but the kind of God that is prior to logic, prior to epistemology, prior to uh, uh, all human argumentation? I mean, that's what you're arguing for in Christianity, right? 
a sovereign, all-knowing, omniscient, personal trinity. You're not arguing for generic theism. Oh, but in per perhaps you are, but when you're doing that, uh-oh. Christianity is literally a different story. Before I explain why, I must note that in previous debates, Matt has said there is a difference between claims and evidence. He said there is no evidence for the resurrection, only claims about things that happened to Jesus and his apostles. But most historical evidences, nearly all of them, are just claims that something happened, including unusual things. If I told Matt I rode an elephant across the Swiss Alps, he might want extraordinary evidence for such an extraordinary claim. But the only evidence for the Carthaginian general Hannibal crossing the Alps with war elephants in the third century BC is just a claim made by a Roman historian decades after it happened. Yet this is a good point to refute one of Matt's assumptions, right? Which it's correct that I mean, in a sense, um, is there a difference between making or asserting something and making an argument? Yes. But Matt is apparently unaware of history, that history isn't a thing that you prove with empirical evidence. I mean, as an empiricist <laughs> or a supposed empiricist, this is really embarrassing. I mean, Matt should know this, right? You can't empirically observe what Hannibal did. You can't empirically observe what Plato and Socrates were up to. All you have is claims from history. So Matt really fumbles on a really stupid point in, in this debate. And this is precisely what um, Lewis clips out, which is correct, what I think where, where Trent's going to get him on this. No major historian doubts this took place, even though historians don't even agree on basic facts, like what route Hannibal took. So given this proper understanding of historical evidence, what is the evidence for the resurrection? The most important evidence would be claims that Jesus appeared in a bodily form to groups of his disciples after death. So how could we explain these claims? Well, here are four possibilities. So again, you know, in this debate with Matt, it's not wrong to give evidences, uh, or evidence, excuse me, but if the debate is about belief in the resurrection as reasonable, then the real debate is about the prior question of reason and the criteria of reason, which Trent, hint, he started with that, but now he's gone into, well, let's act like we all have the same criteria of proof and, and rationality when the atheist worldview is completely, ultimately irrational. Um, and then let's, on those grounds, act as if I'm not debating an atheist, but I'm debating a you know, person with the same criteria as me. But he'd asked at the beginning what Matt's criteria is. Uh, and I like that he's critiquing um, Matt's inconsistency on historical claims. But the reason that this debate is not going to go anywhere ultimately be is because he's not challenging Matt's presuppositions of autonomy and atheism itself in terms of um, worldviews as if just believing in the resurrection is somehow like a theory neutral fact again matt can accept the resurrection and reject christianity right and that's the whole assumption of the piecemeal foundationalist approach is that oh well if i just you know come up with a few of these basic ideas then maybe maybe he'll, it'll be likely probable for matt to accept christianity but i mean why does he have to accept christianity merely because he accepts some person resurrecting or rising from the dead uh, you know, there was a great point Bonson always used to say about this, is, which is that, I mean, couldn't the atheist just say, well, crazy things happen? Um, but why does crazy things happening entail that I should accept Christianity? One, the claims never happened and were invented by later Christians as a legendary development. The problem with this explanation is that we have Paul's writings and he had contact with the disciples and even makes this claim about himself. We also have accounts from Luke, who shows himself to be a very reliable historian. I, Father Deacon makes a great point in his paper, which is that if I'm going to grant that the atheist has the correct criteria of reason and the correct epistemology to investigate and evaluate evidences from the outset, then couldn't the atheist turn around and, you know, point out that, uh, could just ban that Mosin dude. He's not welcome here. He's a liar. He came into the Discord uh, under the auspices that he was an inquirer, but he wasn't. So could you block him? I've already blocked. I've already blocked him on uh, other arenas. So 
if you're a mod, I can't see him because I blocked him on another channel. So if you're a mod, just block him. He that dude's a liar. Um, I mean, again, th these people act like nothing has happened in the last 500 years of philosophy, right? Like, not aware of the last cent several centuries of debates and epistemology. I'm saying, but for both of these parties here, right? Uh, and that doesn't mean I think that like Matt wins or no, I'm sure Matt loses this debate, but, um, the foundationalist approaches to these questions, um, they just ignore the questions that we ask. They both documents these appearances and Peter's testimony about the resurrection in Acts 2. Finally, if the disciples never claimed Jesus rose from the dead, then we have no explanation for how church communities based on this belief arose so quickly when other messianic movements fell apart after the death of their leaders. This is why scholars universally agree that an authentic experience motivated the disciples to make these claims. The agnostic New Testament scholar Paula Fredrickson says, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say, and then all the historical evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. I wasn't there, I don't know what they saw. But I do know that as a historian that they must have seen something. Similarly, the atheistic historian Richard Carrier says, I think it more probable that Peter and James, and certainly Paul, maybe several others, saw something that inspired their faith. I think it most likely that others had these visions earlier than Paul, and that Paul's letters give more or less a correct version of his own experiences, such as his persecution of the early believers. The disciples, maybe they just made the resurrection claims, they made the claims, uh, but they were lying. But this doesn't really explain the involvement of outsiders like Paul and James, who had no reason to lie, or the evidence of the disciples' sincerity and their willingness to be persecuted. Maybe the three, maybe the disciples sincerely believed they saw the risen Jesus, but they were mistaken. They had some kind of grief-induced hallucination. Uh, but this, this doesn't explain many other facts related to Jesus' death. One, we should be skeptical of the disciples being grief-stricken. It's equally likely they were angry, they wasted... Yeah, but again, even if you do demonstrate that, why should I on this piecemeal approach? I mean, if this is if this is the approach that we should take, then shouldn't you piecemeal convince me of every doctrine of Christianity? I mean, if it's a piecemeal approach, then you're going to be bound then to give me piecemeal evidence of every single doctrine within Christianity unless you would just argue for the paradigm as a whole. I mean, wouldn't that make much more sense? I mean, the atheist does not have the competent, correct criteria of evidence. In fact, he can't give an account of evidence at all, much less reasoning, much less proofs, much less logic, all of which are prior to the actual doing of evidential analysis. I mean, I don't, why can these people not get this, right? There's questions that are prior to logic and argumentation and evaluation of evidences, namely epistemological questions, right? If you're going to make metaphysical assumptions about what exists, the nature of that evidence, the, uh, you know, how it relates to other evidences, formulating theories, etc., that's all interpretations of things in the domain of, you know, what exists, metaphysical realities that you're just assuming, right? But you haven't demonstrated on foundationalist grounds the metaphysical principles and truths that are being used in the evaluation of evidence and that are assumed in in this evidence. You're not you haven't demonstrated the logical principles, the epistemological principles that are prior to the metaphysics. You're just assuming that that's the case. And yeah, you could say, well, but Matt's assuming the same thing too. So aren't we on the same page? No, we're not. Because just because you're doing that doesn't mean that you have the good, the same good reasons to do that. That's what justification is about. That's what the whole point of um, why we, we, we don't want to grant that the atheist has the ability to give coherent, justified, meaningful interpretations of the evidence. It's giving him too much. years of their life following another failed messiah moreover paul and james were not grief-stricken over jesus's death because they weren't believers when he was crucified two 
Since ancient Jews believed the resurrection wouldn't take place until the end of the world, it follows that even if they had grief-induced hallucinations, the disciples would have thought they saw Jesus' soul in heaven, not his glorified body on earth. Moreover, given their fierce monotheism, we would expect them to hallucinate Jesus as a man exalted in heaven, and not as the creator... Um, I'm going to take issue with the notion of fierce monotheism. Uh, again, the New Testament doesn't use, and there's no not there's no usage of the term monotheism as Dr. Branson has shown uh, anywhere in this period. That's a much later term. Uh, monotheism uh, is it, isn't really there. If you read the Cappadocians, it's the monarchia of the Father. Right. And the Nicene Creed's definition of the we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So the identification of the one God begins with the person of the Father in the Creed. Um, so it is actually not the case that the apostles and the Jews believed in and defended a radical monotheism. That's a myth. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as an Old Testament Unitarianism that gives way to Trinitarian theology in the New Testament. And this is fundamental to our system and to our theology. Orthodox theology is always insistent that the God of the Old Testament is the Trinity, just as much as the God of the New Testament is the Trinity, you see. So uh, fundamentally weird uh, mistake on the part of Trent there. But I think that's just because Trent's in the system of Roman Catholicism and, uh, you know, it's probably in, in, in large degree a Thomist. Maybe he takes issue with some of Thomas's, Thomas's teachings. I don't know, but... Uh, you know, the, the, the Thomist doctrine of simplicity uh, usually lends to people arguing that the Old Testament doctrine of the Unitarian monotheism was just kind of a given, right? Abraham believed in a generic unity, a, a generic Unitarian God, which is precisely what Muslims argue. Um, no. In fact, the Old Testament doctrine is the Trinity. When the church fathers in the New Testament or excuse me, in the post-apostolic uh, uh, period, Justin Martyr, when they prove the Trinity, when Irenaeus proves the Trinity, when the New Testament writers prove their Trinity doctrine, even though they don't use the word Trinity, they go to the Old Testament. They go to the Old Testament. That's the number one starting point for proving the Trinity. When we argue with the Muslims, where do we prove the Trinity? The Old Testament, which we couldn't do if the Old Testament taught a bare Unitarian radical monotheism. So that's just false. Himself, unless but uh, again, Roman Catholics don't have the Trinity. They're heterodox on the Trinity. And I'm not saying that to insult Trent. I don't have any ill will or uh, call into question, you know, Trent's motives at all. Uh, just factually speaking, the Orthodox position is that the Roman Catholics do not have the correct Trinitarian doctrine. Jesus told them he used divine power to raise himself from the dead. Three, Paul tells us Jesus appeared to groups of people, and the closest thing we have to group hallucinations, or mass hysteria, usually involve people psychosomatically experiencing a similar illness, not individuals claiming to all see the same thing that doesn't exist, especially something that does, didn't conform to their previous expectations. Four, the New Testament authors repeatedly make it clear when someone has a dream, a vision, where they think they've seen a ghost or a spirit. The resurrection appearances in the New Testament all point toward groups of people seeing an embodied, recently deceased individual that would not be the subject of an hallucination. Five, since the resurrection was preached in Jerusalem, within a few weeks of the crucifixion, the disciples, or, en or enemies of the faith, could have checked Jesus' tomb to see if they were hallucinating. And the evidence suggests they... You know, all of these kinds of arguments, the, the reason that they're... Uh... I just don't think they're very good. They're not very convincing is because again, they all rest on assumptions that aren't being questioned that aren't going to solve any of these disputes. It's like, well, if this, then it seems like this could have been the case, or it seems like they would have done this and maybe they could have done that. It's all this like really hypothetical stuff that is really indeterminate. Right. And, and it's only, reasonable to accept Trent's conclusions on Trent's theory and uh, criteria of reasoning, right? On Trent's epistemology. And so I don't think Trent gets the point that you and Matt have radically different accounts of reasoning, evidence, and epistemology. I mean, I'm speaking to Trent the Christian here, not Trent the philosopher. Trent the Christian should agree with me that Matt and he have a completely different account 
and justification for the criteria of justification. So again, all of this is just like, um, let's tell stories about what could have happened or might have happened. And let's see in the scales, like which one's more reasonable and less reasonable. I mean, it's just arbitrary, right? More reasonable on whose criteria or theory of reasoning, which is what Trent first asked Matt, but now he's acting like, I mean, this line of argumentation is 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 as if Matt has the correct line of, of of argumentation and reasoning, but he had first asked Matt. Matt needs to give a standard of what's reasonable, but now the line of argument is acting as if they have the same standards. So, um, I just I just find these these types of arguments, which there might be situations where you would need to say something like, "It's more reasonable to believe this." you know, in some niche dispute about, vi uh, you know, false visions of the apostles or, you know, they, they hallucinated the resurrection. And, <clears throat> but really, again, this is all just ignoring the more fundamental questions that neither of these parties in the debate seem to be grasping. This is the first women whose testimony was not trusted in the ancient world. A fact whose inclusion makes sense is simply being a recollection of what actually happened. This shows that appeals to hallucinations do not easily account for this case because it involves outsiders, appearances to groups, evidence sincerity. Wait a minute. Appeals to hallucination don't easily account for this? So perhaps they do? So you see the problem with evidential approaches to fundamental dogmas is that it places the dogmas in the realm of probability. But God's existence if God is who he says he is, is prior to and grounds even the notion of evidence and probability and reasoning itself. But this is what the classical apologists and you know these, this is what these people can't grasp. They can't grasp that if God is who he says he is, then he's prior to any notions of rationality, reasoning, logic, right? He would be the ground of those things. And so for Trent to concede to Matt that there's probability that the apostles all hallucinated is essentially to concede that there's probability. He may think it's not that probable, but at least there's some probable, there's some percentage likelihood that Christianity is a hallucin hallucination and false. So do you see the point here of what evidentialism is conceding? It's conceding the possibility that Christianity is false and man's reasoning, man's logic man's autonomous reasoning which hasn't been given an account for yet will be the determining factor we'll put god in the docks uh, as c.s lewis said and we'll put him we'll judge whether god has given us sufficient evidence that's what evidentialism is doing in this bogus move but again that's the strength of the transcendental argument presuppositionalism is not granting that it's not granting that you have any theory neutral self-evident notion of logic, argumentation, epistemology, such that you can judge God's existence. But that's essentially what Matt is, that's what Trent is conceding. And if Matt was sophisticated, Matt could say, well, so you're admitting the probability that Christianity is false and a hallucination, and I, I'll just go with that. And a general lack of an expectation for the hallucination in question. Therefore, given that belief in the resurrection doesn't contradict a known fact about Jesus, it doesn't lack evidence it should have if it did happen. And no other usual explanation just as easily accounts for the evidence. I think it's just a really weak line of argumentation. There's no lack of contradictory evidence, so therefore it's probable that there might have been a resurrection. It follows that it's reasonable to believe Jesus rose from the dead. Now, you could stop there and just say Jesus rose, but you don't know how he did, and the resolution for the debate would hold. But we should be explanations for Jesus' resurrection for the same reason we should be skeptical of natural explanations for the claims that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, wait a minute. If we're going to be using standard logic, evidential interpretation, and reasoning, then why would we not accept natural explanations for Christ's resurrection? I mean, on Trent's own argument, those would be more likely because we're in the domain of probability. Likelihood, that's probability. 
Well, judged on how evidences typically go and our normal experience, it's more likely that there's a natural explanation for Christ's resurrection that we just simply don't know about or haven't seen yet, right? I mean, Matt could say all kinds of things. Matt could say, this is something Bonson always used to say, like, well, maybe there's a natural explanation that we just don't know yet. So how does this prove Christianity to me, right? I mean, if Matt was sophisticated, that's the line of argument I would take. I don't think Matt's that sophisticated. He's going to say, these are just claims, and claims aren't arguments, and you can't prove anything from history with these claims, which Matt's not even going to realize means that, you know, all of history was really, he knows nothing of history, right? Because as a basic bitch empiricist, Matt's not going to be able to give an account for anything outside of his empirical sense data, which is what I raised to Matt multiple times in the debate, which he never got. If natural causes are behind them, we would expect these causes to produce many similar resurrection claims. But the resurrection is very unique. Uh, the world. Re- no, that's not. Uh, that's a non sequitur, Trent. So that's begging the question. So Trent just said that if there was a natural explanation for the resurrection, we should expect resurrections to be happening naturally. No, not necessarily. Maybe this was a one-off, just a weird event. There's no necessary connection or reason that I ought to conclude that because this weird thing happened one time, and perhaps there's a natural explanation that we just don't know about, that it should be happening all the time. No, that simply doesn't follow. On atheist Antony Flew once said, the evidence for the resurrection is better than for claimed miracles in any other religion. It's outstandingly different in quality and quantity. However, if supernatural explanations are allowed, then couldn't we propose them for almost anything and destroy their explanatory? Now, that is a a worthwhile point that does come into valid use of uh, evidences. Um, So I would say, for example, yeah, when it comes to like evidence for the New Testament, it's one of the most attested to documents in history. Far more evidence for the veracity of the New Testament, you know, the Bible, the text, etc. than for Plato. A lot of people don't know this, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot more evidential evidence for those things, which can help to strengthen and confirm our faith. But I mean, again, piling up a bunch of evidences typically doesn't convince convince the more sophisticated atheists, right? Because the way that you're going to interpret the evidence is going to be based on your theory of evidence as your paradigm. And so, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I like the analogy of the rose colored glasses, right? When, when we feed a bunch of evidences to the atheist, for example, let's use the atheist example, right? The atheist has rose colored glasses to where the, the evidence is going to be always reinterpreted according to his naturalistic paradigm. Oh, uh, a guy was raised from the dead. Uh, very possible. Uh, maybe there's a naturalistic explanation. We just don't know for, Bodies that pass out and resuscitate three days later. Uh, You know, and X, Y, Z continue down the line for any other so-called miracle, right? The atheist can just say, okay, uh, again, I interpret that within my naturalistic framework. So in order to really get to the point, it's not going to work to just machine, and I'm, I'm not saying Trent's doing this, but just in, in principle, in general, for the uh, evidentialist approach, for me to just, you know, like pile up, look at all these papers that have been written for, you know, intelligent design and for the rational, rational belief in the resurrection of Christ. And look at all these papers that show that uh, it's probably very likely that the New Testament is authentic in what it describes and records. I mean, again, the atheist is just going to interpret all that according to his autonomous paradigm. If you don't challenge the rose-colored glasses, it's just a weak approach. It's not going to do very good. And it's granting him too much. Well, first, if that were true, atheists who say the universe exists without a cause would commit the same fallacy because having no cause could explain anything we don't understand. Second, we can rule out many unusual explanations. I think that's a fair point, though. It is it is worth calling out the atheist um, usage of things like Uh, Oh, give me the, grant me the big bang, which has no cause. And then I can explain everything else having a cause. Right. So they want, they always want that. Like, Oh, give me this grant, the the exception. Right. Uh, Don't question my metaphysical presupposition. Grant me this, right. Grant me this epistemological principle and I can show you everything. Right. 
Um, just grant me one thing and I can move the world. God or aliens as unreasonable because they're ad hoc. There's no reason to appeal to them uh, aside from explanatory power. For example, in 1872, the Mary Celeste was found adrift at sea in relatively decent condition with ample supplies on board. Now, I'm not sure about that on evidentialist grounds, why um, the alien hypothesis would be less reasonable than Trent's evidentialist approach to the resurrection. Again, you're going to interpret the evidence as according to your presuppositions and your paradigm, right? Your, your network of beliefs that you already hold as your core beliefs are going to be the ones that interpret the incoming evidence. So why and on what grounds would we think that the alien hypothesis is less rational as an evidentialist than the theist position? And I'm sure Trent would list a whole bunch of things, but that's kind of begging the question, right? Because I'm asking a question about the theory of evidences themselves, not your list of evidences. And it's like what the evidentialists do is say, well, let me give you more evidences. But I'm saying, I'm asking you a question about theory of evidence, evidence itself. What counts as evidence? How do we interpret facts, evidences? So for you to just keep giving me evidences isn't answering, answering the prior epistemic question that I'm asking. The 10 passengers and crew <coughs> and historians still don't know why they all got in a lifeboat and left a seaworthy vessel. You could say that God told them to leave as a test of faith and took them up to heaven or aliens abducted them, uh, but there's no evidence that remotely points in that direction. Uh, now, the ship's log said something about heavenly voices or a ship in the sky. Yeah, the problem that the, the difference here is that Christianity as a worldview is not like this example of the the boat and the missing people. Christianity is arguing and has a worldview and a position that gives an account for everything in the world, right? It's a it, it's the grounding of your metaphysics and your epistemology and your ethic. And the example and the analogy that you gave, uh, it doesn't attempt to do that. So while I understand the analogy, I don't think the analogy works to to match it up to what the religion of Christianity is supposed to be and is supposed to do in terms of worldviews. You might have a reason for an extraterrestrial or supernatural explanation, but it didn't. However, the resurrection is different because we have reasons to believe God was involved based on the nature of the disciples' testimony. Wait, we have reasons to believe God. So are we still in the probability of the resurrection here? But again, if Matt is granted the autonomy to uh, reject as a possibility that Christianity isn't the explanation for Christ's resurrection, then you've already lost the debate. Uh, the debate needs to be couched as uh, a, you must accept this or else, right? I mean, um, there's no logical refuge from God or from Christianity. It's Christianity or nothing. That's the point and the power of the transcendental argument and of presuppositional apologetics is that precisely that it doesn't grant to Matt or any of the atheists this refuge this common ground into the even if you think it's a small percentile it doesn't matter because it's essentially conceding that there's a possibility that christianity doesn't account for any of these things and islam is true or judaism is true or paganism is true or no religion is true any of the other positions might be the case but when we look at the new testament what do we see the writers arguing no of a certitude that christ is resurrected peter says does Peter say, no of a great probability with 98%, Jesus was probably resurrected? Why don't the apostles and the New Testament writers and Paul, when he goes out and does apologetics, why does it never look like these people? Where was Paul's list of probable reasons for the re resurrection? Does Paul ever speak like it was probable or likely? that Christ was resurrected? Of course not. No of a certitude that Christ was resurrected, Peter says. That means if you're a non-Christian who believe God exists, which is half of religiously unaffiliated Americans. I mean, that's another point I want to stress too, is that the approach of evidentialism is like, I can do apologetics divorced from my theology. Uh, no, how, how is that, does make, that make any sense? 
I mean, the apologetics is supposed to direct people to the theology. If the apologetics leads to bad theology, it's bad apologetics. And that's precisely what this stuff does. It doesn't point to the type of God that we're trying to argue for in the Trinity, in Trinitarian theology, fiercely Trinitarian. Even our enemies, James White, even James White, who hates everything that we stand for and what we talk about, what we do, even he admits Orthodox Christianity uh, outside of all the other groups is fiercely Trinitarian. Yeah, exactly. And we take pride in that because we're the only religion that has the correct Trinitarian doctrine. And the whole of our theology is literally grounded in that, including, get this, revolutionary idea, apologetics. What? You mean the Trinity affects our apologetics? Yes, absolutely. I'm interested in proving and defending and convincing the atheist, the Muslim, the cult member of the Trinity as much as I am any of the other doctrines. And we'll get in that, into that, I'm, I'm sure, tomorrow when we get into generic theism and how this is a bogus, uh, ridiculous idea. There's no such thing as generic theism. And that's precisely what natural theology is predicated on. You could consider the resurrection within your own current worldview. What if you don't believe God exists and so it seems like there's nothing to cause Jesus to rise from the dead? Well, the resurrection could make you rethink that idea. But I might also argue an argument for the existence of God. Uh, this one. So here he's addressing the challenge that I said earlier, like, okay, well, maybe Christ was raised from the dead, um, but weird things happen, and there's no reason that I should accept Christianity. And now he's going to go into the, you know, classical arguments, which... All the hmm. argument from change. Um, I like it. It goes like this. Change occurs when a potential X becomes an actual Y. We see change all the time. It could be like growth or movement, but no potential X can become an actual Y on its own <coughs> more than water can freeze itself or a train car can propel it. Okay, so again, right away, I mean, this is terrible argumentation. I mean, we, uh, if Matt was savvy, of course, Matt's not, does, can't do philosophy. I mean, admit it, I'm not trying to be mean to Matt. I mean, I think it was evident in our debate when he called in um, Ozzy and uh, Malpass or who, whoever did the review where they tried to cope and help him out after our debate. Um, I mean, that was evident. Matt, Matt was out of it. He didn't know what he was talking about. Like, I don't know what's going on in the philosophy stuff, right? <laughs> Give me the simple sort of Reddit uh, arguments and claims. Um, but we, we get into this epistemology stuff, justification, uh, circularity, induction, all the things that I brought up to Matt, he was, he was lost. So, uh, don't, ex we shouldn't expect that Matt is going to be too swift in, um, responding to these things. But if it's the case that you're, that Trent's going to begin with the self supposedly self-evident notions like change uh and causation and potentiality and actuality i mean dude that's assuming the aristotelian metaphysic okay i'm not saying that i out of hand reject everything to do with aristotle's metaphysics but in a debate okay the first thing i would do if i was matt is i would say okay on your basis as a Thomist or foundationalist or whatever you want to call yourself, classical theist. Um, I'm not going to grant you that all of that metaphysical baggage is the case. You're going to need to de demonstrate to me the prior questions of epistemology before you can start making all these metaphysical claims. This is the same thing I would say to an atheist. Do you remember the Stefan Molyneux debate? In the Stefan Molyneux debate, I asked a lot of the same questions in different ways that I asked to Azra Rashid. Why would I ask the same questions to Azra Rashid that I do to Stefan Molyneux? The answer is that both of those positions come from a peripatetic axiom kind of starting point. There's nothing in the intellect that's not first in the senses.
So they're both uh, empirically oriented in their starting points. And when you do that, you kind of lock yourself into a specific, very limited type of epistemology. So the problem with that, though, is that I can critique the presuppositions of that epistemology that will cut you off from being able to make any of the metaphysical claims that you make that underlie the arguments you're making. So if you can't get to the external world and all that stuff, then none of this change argument is going to get you anywhere because you need to demonstrate the stuff prior to that, that you know about the external world, that you're actually seeing causation, et cetera, et cetera, right? All the Humean Kantian type questions. So I'm not going to grant you that any more than I granted it to Stefan Molyneux or Azra Rashid. And, and why is that? Because Azra Rashid and Trent and Stefan Molyneux all have the same empiricist starting point. I'm not saying they're empiricists strictly. They're not. The starting point of their worldview and knowledge and metaphysical claims is going to be basically what Aristotle says in posterior analytics, in the metaphysics, and in a couple other places, right? The distinction between what is better known in itself and what is better known by us and the peripatetic axiom, right? There's nothing in the intellect that's not first in the senses. Now, if Matt was swoof, that's right where Matt would go. He should, right? I don't think Matt's going to do that, <laughs> right? I, I don't expect Matt to go there. Uh, Matt, this is all going to fly over Matt's head. And what Matt's going to do, I'm guessing, is he's going to say, uh, uh, everything from history is claims, and uh, I don't find them uh, personally convincing. And Trent's correctly going to say, that's a, uh, by a, a, a psychological descriptor, right? That's a description of your psychological states. Ooh, not an argument, right? One of the famous, one of the classic things Matt loves to say not, not an argument. Um, yeah, Matt, that's not an argument. Did you know that? And it's very easy to show that the fact that you find something unconvincing isn't an argument. Itself. Instead, something like a freezer or a locomotive has to actualize the potential for change. But then these actualizers only change because other things actualize them. So could an infinite series explain why we have change at all? Well, no, just as an infinitely long train of boxcars would sit motionless without a locomotive, an infinite number of things that must be actualized by something else would be changeless unless there were... Yeah, again, that's all assuming a host of metaphysical baggage that if Matt's a good debater, he will go right to the epistemic presuppositions there. So wait a minute, before you do this metaphysics, demonstrate to me on, epis on uh, empiricist grounds... that you're justified in saying all these things. The cause of the series is just pure actuality. So just as a locomotive pulls without being pulled, this uncaused cause for the series would actualize everything without being actualized by anything else. It'd be pure actuality. And since the universe contains a mixture of potential and actual, it, it can't be that uncaused cause. Uh, but if there's a cause of the universe that's purely actual, what, what would it be like? Well, if it has no potential, it can't change because change is potential going to actual. If it's changeless, it would have to be immaterial and timeless because material temporal objects... Right, so, I mean, Matt doesn't know any of this Aristotelian philosophy that Trent's relying on, so he's not going to be able to deal with any of this. But if, again, if he was swift, he would not accept all of Trent's metaphysical claims because it's like everybody thinks you can just do philosophy and make claims without addressing the questions that have been asked for the last 500 years. Um... I'm sorry you can't, okay? So we're going to have to deal with the last well, 400 years of philosophy, we'll say, where people have questioned what's prior to doing metaphysics, epistemology. And it's, it doesn't work to just say like Phaser and the people in, in Trent's camp typically do. Well, the, 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 the starting points are all just properly basic. Phaser says, uh, well, all these things are true because they're commonly general commonly general you think that counts as a justification for your first principles i mean i was just reading scotus by the way who says there's not an argument for the first principles they're not provable he thinks that they're rational and you should believe them but they're not provable 
Well, yeah. I mean, if you believe in natural theology and you think that you have to demonstrate, right, every proposition and thing that you believe in, it seems to follow that you should demonstrate why you should believe in the first principles, but they're not. Proof. That, that, grant me those, please, right? And, oh, I don't have to give a justification for them because um, they're just, they're properly basic. Okay, yeah, that's begging the question. And I'm not going to grant that you have the right criteria of justification to say that that's properly basic, right? I mean, that's what philosophy is, is that we question our, our assumptions. We question, this is the whole history of philosophy. Back to Socrates, the apology goes around questioning everybody. And Trent loves to do cross-examination and question people. So it will be interesting to see uh, what happens with that tomorrow. It's always change. Uh, the cause couldn't be limited in power, knowledge, or existence because these imply potentials and it doesn't have any potential. Uh, the cause would be uh, omnipotent, omniscient, have necessary existence. Again, this is just throwing out all the, uh, you know, Swinburne style, like basic bitch assumptions about natural theology, which I, I hope Trent brings all that tomorrow because that's going to be fun. But um, I mean, I. <laughs> Uh, if you're if you're watching this right now and you want to get a little bit of a, a teaser, um, go read the Russ Mannion paper, Contingency of Knowledge, because the section where Dr. Mannion goes into foundationalism and goes into all of these you know classic problems in the history of philosophy and especially in Western philosophy in the last 500 years, everything Trent's saying is is acting like none of those questions have been asked. So. Before you say all this stuff, you're going to have to give an account for things prior to these things. And again, I, I wish I was atheist Matt. I could ask those questions, right? I will get to tomorrow. I'm joking. I'm not atheist Matt, but you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, if I was, as I hear this, I know all the stuff I would say. And, and I, just, I can't wait for the disaster, right? The, the Matt, the, the Dilla, Dilla, the, the Dilla disaster that will be the response because uh, it had no potential for non-existence. Uh, it would also be uh, all good because evil is a lack of goodness and this cause lacks nothing. This is like all of this stuff that he's saying, right? From the he, he went from the thing that is the first cause supposed to be changeless to now all this list of divine attributes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think everybody who knows about Garabi, right? I hope that this comes up tomorrow. Has no potentiality. Also, the cause would be personal and not a mere force, <coughs> because the only immaterial things that exist are minds and abstract entities like numbers. But ab personal. I wonder where the concept of personhood comes from. Right? Is that uh, in theology? Where does that come from? I wonder. Uh, the Trinity, maybe. Abstract entities can't cause anything. They're causally a feat. Uh, so this means the ultimate cause of the universe, causally impotent, I should say. Uh, must um, I may bring this up tomorrow, actually, in my opening statement. So, you know, the, the people, a lot of times people think, I'm not saying Trent thought this, but a lot of people think that there's an advantage to going second in the debate, which is kind of a noob um, view of debates because no, actually there's quite a few advantages to going first because the person that goes first um, can potentially diffuse uh, a lot of the argumentation in his opponent's um, opening statement if he has a good idea of the types of things that his opponents are going to say, right? So if I diffuse enough of uh, Trent's opening line of argumentation, you see the advantage that I can have if I go first, right? So it, it's not always an advantage for people to... to to have the second, you know, position in the debate. Be something that's similar to a mind that exists in an unlimited way. And so for a lot of people, that's what they mean by the word God. Finally, as the debate continues. Ooh, yes, he did it. That's what we were looking for, right? Now, in the Cosmic Skeptic debate where we gave Trent, you know, props, he definitely won that debate. And, I'm, and I, I feel sure that he wins this debate too. Um, what we were really looking for was that right there. So, um, now we have Trent kind of on record saying it. Uh, I don't think tomorrow he's going to shift his position or take a different approach. 
Um, but that's really what we were looking for in terms of what we want to lock down in terms of Trent's argumentation for natural theology. Uh, so that means right there that, again, I think it'll be difficult for Trent to um, go in a different direction, uh, given what he just said right there. And this this was April. This was, this was six months ago. <laughs> so I doubt Trent's changed his position in six months. Um, and again, I don't see how as a Roman Catholic, he really could change his position. I mean, they're kind of locked into the view that they have on natural theology. Um, so tomorrow, yeah. So people are asking, right. Tomorrow night, the debate is, uh, I shared it on my community tab. Um, it's on my website. It's in the discord, right? Tomorrow night it's on Twitter. Uh, Trent and I will be debating natural theology. The very thing that Trent just kind of got into right there, uh, on Sue on Sona's channel tomorrow. So uh, that's tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Central. So look for that. Uh, tonight we're just having fun doing another review of um, one of the debates that I meant to, to watch but I forgot about, which is Matt and Trent uh, on the resurrection. Don't forget about Matt's burden of proof. Uh, he has Actually, I need to, to write this down. unreasonable to believe Jesus rose from the dead. So keep asking this question as you hear his opening statement. Matt says belief in the resurrection is unreasonable because fill in the blank. So as the debate <laughs> continues, uh, I think you'll see that Matt reason, his reasons that fill in the blank are flawed because they either lead us to one, uh, rejecting many facts of history we already know to be reasonable. This is a good and point. And two, they make- That point I think is killer and that's really what's gonna be a stickler for Matt, given the fact that I've seen uh, Lewis's uh, clipped out video. So that we agree with. I think that's a great point. So I'll, g I'll give uh, Trent props for that argument. And, and that's what's really going to trip up Matt. I don't think Matt ever even gets it, right? Like, if you watch the Lewis's clipped out video of this, it's like Matt doesn't even get it. Arbitrary judgments about reality based on Matt's assumptions about the world instead of keeping an open mind about how the world works. Yes, that is a great point. So props to Trent for that. Uh, so instead of that particular epistemology or way of not that term will show up a lot of epistemology that just means the study of knowing like how do we know about the world how do we figure out what's really going on okay uh so i have a way of figuring out what's going on when it comes to unusual events i gave a three-pronged test for it uh and i hope matt proposes a way of figuring out how to this is good to discern unusual events and claims of unusual i i wish trent had gone more into epistemology although he might have got called out for if he went too far into epistemology because matt would have been oh that's not the uh, topic of this debate the topic of this debate is uh resurrection not epistemology right um but i i wouldn't have done the debate this way of course but you know whatever uh, so but that's that is a good point so I'm, I'm glad that he did at least lead off and kind of conclude with questioning Matt's presuppositions of evidence and criteria and uh, and and epistemology but the that middle part there I would have to disagree with events and as I said he'll try to show that this unusual event the resurrection is unreasonable because fill in the blank what why does he think it's unreasonable uh, and then you'll see those reasons either lead to rejecting other reasonable beliefs or they end up being arbitrary Instead, I would argue that you should accept the standard that I've offered and then seriously consider the truth and meaning. Uh, one thing I will say that right there, uh, from a tactical standpoint, that was a good move on Trent's part because what he did there at the end was kind of frame the debate. So uh, what Trent was doing wasn't just giving his case. He was also kind of trying to get Matt to be on the defensive and kind of go down the trail of answering Trent's questions due to Trent's opening statement and questions in the opening statement, which uh, nothing wrong with doing that. It's it's a, a you know rhetorical strategy, a, a, a tactic in debate. There's nothing wrong with tactics per se. I'm not saying debate. I mean, debates involve tactics, right? But um, it's not all tactics. Obviously, if it's just tactics, then you're you're never going to win. You're just going to be seen as a, a douchebag, right? Um, but that's a, that's a useful tactic to, to again, in the opening statement, try to frame the debate. Everybody tries to do this, right? It's not like a secret. Anybody who does the opening statement <clears throat> will try to frame the debate 
and kind of force the guy who goes second <clears throat> uh, to answer his challenges and his questions and you know try to diffuse the guy who goes second. The, the, the opening statement wants to diffuse the um, the guns, right? The, the big guns that the, the guy who goes second brings. <clears throat> and Jesus Christ having risen from the dead and consequently demonstrating the truth of the Christian faith. Again, this is where we see two different Trents, right? We see Trent, the Christian apologist, who's trying to, I think, genuinely and, and with sincere motives, bring people to Christianity, but then doing a Trent, the philosopher apologist, who grants too much and, and, and doesn't do, uh, gets too much into probabilities and things that grant the autonomous atheist unbeliever way too much. All right. Thanks, Trent. Matt, whenever you want to start, we will. Uh, I'll click the fifteen-minute timer. No rush. All right, thank you. All right. So first of all, thanks for having me here. I, I appreciate it. It's nice to meet Trent virtually for the first time and to uh, hang out with the Finds with Aquinas crew and fans. Uh, thanks everybody for for showing up to this, uh, especially because I didn't do too much to promote it as I had weird technical issues this week. So let's get started. First of all, it is not my intent ever to offend people, but the nature of these discussions about topics that are at the heart of people's deeply held beliefs often offends. I, I once believed many of the things that many of you... I, don't, I mean, I don't guess it's wrong in principle to say this at the beginning of your opening statement, but... Uh, I mean, th this is really irrelevant to the debate, like that i mean i guess you could say this is part of the rhetoric like he wants to frame it like hey uh you know i'm trying to make you guys mad i'm cool uh, we're all cool not really that relevant to the topic i mean I believe i believe many of the things that trent believed including a belief in the bodily resurrection it's difficult to state something like that without someone interpreting it as oh now he thinks he's better than us uh, i don't necessarily think i'm better than any of you as people but i do believe that my position is more rational and if that bothers you, I'd ask you to consider whether you think your position is more rational. So uh, I think Matt is kind of actually accidentally stumbling upon the type of argument that I would say. But I would, again, point out that the, this whole debate is assuming that both of the parties have a, a correct common ground of what's rational. They don't, in fact, at all. They're going to have completely different accounts of what is rational, what reason is, what logic is, right? So, I, I don't think, I, I think that's a, actually an interesting statement, but it's not the way that Matt actually meant it to be understood. <laughs> that makes it interesting, right? That's the funny part of this. Because if your answer is yes, then we're in the same boat and we can argue it out. And if your answer is no, then you need to consider why you are willingly, knowingly holding a view that you consider less rational than the alternative. So how do we go about telling if Again, like more rational, less rational, probable, less probable. This all rests on a prior question and consideration of what rationality, probability, evidences, proofs, justifications are. And that has not been raised except by Trent, but he didn't really press it. Maybe later on he will. But again, Matt doesn't grasp this. He, he's never grasped this. It's reasonable to believe a claim. And then it's worth noting this is separate from whether or not the claim is in fact true. The claim could be false, and yet you could still have a reasonable belief in it. For once, once upon a time, it was reasonable to believe that the sun went around the earth because that's what we saw when we looked up in the sky. Uh, it, it, was, it would have been absurd to think that the Earth was spinning at, at an unbelievable rate. So, again, um, Matt seems to be equating reasonable with what's commonly accepted. And maybe some people do that, but that's not actually what's in debate here, right? It really doesn't matter like the number of people that accept something has nothing to do with whether it, it's even rational or not. I mean, I could give an easy defeater for that just by pointing out that isn't it possible that uh, a large portion of the world believes something irrational? Exactly. Yeah. So this is just like really low level stuff here. And one of the reasons why I would call it unbelievable. And yet that was the truth. 
So what's I mean, Matt's own position is that most of the world believes in some kind of God or deity, and he thinks that's irrational. So the numbers of people that believe something has nothing to do with whether, in fact, the belief itself is rational or irrational. It's totally irrelevant. Reasonable to believe in what's true are separate, but we're stuck because we may not actually ever have access to the truth. So all we can hope for is what's reasonable. So how do you... We may not ever have access to the truth. I mean, of empirical claims or truth at all. I mean, I, I don't think Matt even gets the distinctions between these types of claims and, the t and types of truths and types of... Uh, I mean, if you remember in our debate, Matt literally acts, acts like everything is proven the same way. And when I questioned his principles of proof and evidences from the outset, he had no idea what I was arguing. He, he was lost. Oh, what's reasonable? Well, there's many answers to that, and they are all problematic because at the in the end of the day, uh, each individual is going to be responsible for determining what's reasonable to them, and the rest of society is going to say, ah, you're unreasonable. So again, uh, this is so uh, like mind-blowingly dumb that Matt thinks that rationality and what's reasonable is a social construct. I mean, that's essentially what he just said. Like everybody's responsible as individuals. So he's got a relativistic account of what is reasonable. Um, I mean, reasonable beliefs means reasons for the beliefs, right? The, the beliefs that you, you, you think you have good reasons for what you believe. And Matt's basically saying that that's all determined by the subjective tastes or states of the individual. I mean, that's completely ludicrous, right? Just just philosophical garbage nonsense, like so easy to refute. And I'm sure Trent will do that. But I mean, does, that, does, does Matt really think that? I mean, it, it's, it's hard to actually believe that he thinks this, right? I mean, most atheists do. I'm not doubting it, but it's like, do, do you even grasp that when you come to a debate, you're presupposing objective rules of logic and argumentation? Do you, do you get, I mean, debate wouldn't be possible if you didn't assume that, right? The, the two parties couldn't be appealing to the rules and laws of logic and debate. Or you're incredibly... We, we often use the example in Discord, right? When the atheists come of chess. I mean, when you come and play chess, you're agreeing when you come to the table to the rules of chess. Like, you don't have the right, you don't get to like, Oh, I, I'm going to play my chess. Okay, right. I'm, and what is your chess? Well, my the, my rules for chess are I bring my uh, uh, checker pieces and I thump them at your pieces. And when I knock your pieces off, I win. And that's what I think chess is. Because that's not chess. Okay, you're, not, you're playing a different game. That's not the rules of chess. And that's the point here, right? If you come to debate, there are laws of logic, laws and rules of debate that are the case and that you are submitting to by virtue of coming to the debate. And if you don't believe that and reject that, then you're going to lose the debate because you're debating. You're refuting yourself. Remember the JF debate? This is what happened, right? But I don't, Matt, Matt just doesn't even seem to have a clue about this. Reasonable. And so we try to work together. This is one of the reasons why we have scientific methods that remove as much of the bias. And I mean, imagine being so uh, low tier scientism, basic bitch empiricism that you think the scientific method is going to tell you what reason is, rationality is, and what's, I mean, it's, it's like the, the questions of epistemology, Matt, are prior to the doing of science, the making of claims the making of arguments claiming how the world is or isn't right and you can't just like I'm going to critique Trent likewise you can't just start saying things without prior consideration and this is what we keep having to remind the, the atheists and the people in the domain of internet philosophy who haven't studied philosophy at the academic level. They don't seem to be aware of the state of the question in academia. I mean, atheists, do you realize that they don't do epistemology anymore, typically speaking? <laughs> this has been surrendered, right? What does Quine say? It's time to give up epistemology as a classical 
enterprise of justification uh, and and rational belief. It's just psychology now. That's the state of the question after Quine, and as Dr. Mannion points out in his paper, the debate hasn't changed from Hume. The debate on epistemology at the academic level is basically still debating Kant and Hume questions. It hasn't progressed since then. The notable paper, The Two Dogmas, reduces epistemology to psychology. That's a surrendering of the discipline. We don't do it anymore. If Hume and Kant are correct. That's why I kept raising in the debate with Matt, Hume and Kant over and over. And Matt had no idea what I was raising, never got or grasped what my objections were and just ignored it. Activity is possible, even though we can't completely remove it. I'd argue in simplest terms, a claim is reasonable if the claim is consistent with what we know to be true and possible within reality. So somebody asked a good question there. Break down the scientific method. That would be a good video because, uh, you know, if you look at somebody like Husserl, um, Husserl had a great breakdown in the logical investigations of the logic and math that the scientific method relies on. And other things such as induction, right? You inductively approach questions and you deduce things. You then make deductive approximations of what's going on in these different cases, right? And so point there is that you can't do this stuff, right? If, if Hume and Kant were correct, there's no basis for science. I mean, this is Kant's whole point, right? Kant saw that if Hume was right, then we're science is done. We we it, we can't. It has no basis because epistemology is gone. And we I'm, I'm not Kantian. We're not saying Kant is correct in total, right? The Kantian system is goof, goofy, right? It's silly. But Kant raised good questions, and he correctly saw that if Hume was right, then this stuff's done. Like we're, we're, we don't have a basis for this stuff. Now, after Kant, some people do come along and raise good questions and make good points. Like Husserl says in the Logical Investigations, that the scientific method proceeds on the basis of logical and mathematical principles. So they're prior to the scientific method. They're presupposed in the scientific method. So, Matt, you can't do those things justifiably without giving an account for the things that are prior to the doing of science. And Matt never got that, and, and has never gotten that, and probably never will get that, right? Short of a miracle. It simply does no good to argue that it's reasonable because it's internally consistent, because that's true for many sci-fi fantasy stories, or at least some of the best ones. Uh, that's an objection to coherentism, which I don't think Trent made any argument about coherentism. So I don't know, where's Matt getting this argument of coherentism and re how you reply to a coherence theory of, of, of truth uh, and knowledge when Trent is not a coherentist and didn't make that argument. So what does the physical evidence about the resurrection tell us? Well, as far as I'm aware, there is no physical evidence. There's only a story and testimonials. Testimonials about, you know, hey, so-and-so's. So I'm anticipating, I think, if I remember from the Lewis clip, where Trent goes with this. And it's like, Matt, do you not understand that what you're saying is like, makes the, the discipline of history impossible? Now, I don't think Matt is going to be so absurd as to think that there's no such thing as the discipline of history. But... Matt doesn't understand that the arguments that he's making actually make history impossible. There's, there's not anything like history. And Trent already kind of brought that up and anticipated that in his opening statement, right? But it's like Matt, it's like Matt prepared an opening statement that wasn't interested in Trent's opening statement, which sometimes debaters do because, you know, they want to stick to their notes or whatever and 
uh, they can't do improv or they can't, you know, think on the fly. And I mean, if you go second, that's what you have to do, right? You're going to be bound to, you know, if the guy who went first diffused half of your, you know, uh, big guns that you brought in your opening statement, then you're going to have to think on the fly and like, you know, come up with something better. <laughs> like it's not going to work to give your opening statement, half of which was already addressed in the other guy's opening statement. Or this or this is what happens. If Christianity is true, then the resurrection of Jesus must be the single most important fact in history. And for that fact, we have nothing but hearsay. Now, Matt's criteria of what hearsay is and no historical evidence is actually flatly contradicted by the way all historical evidences and attestation actually works, right? I mean... What's the historical attestation to the existence of Plato? Oh, these medieval manuscripts that are the earliest translations of Plato. Literally. Did you know that the oldest translations of Plato are the Middle Ages? Oh, okay. So, Matt, um, do we also now have no reason to believe in Plato? Do we have no reason to believe in Herodotus? Do we have no reason to believe in, um, you know... Alexander the Great, because the things that will qualify as historical evidences for Alexander, uh, you know, Aristotle, Socrates, will not meet Matt's criterion for what is evidence of historical things. So this is so dumb on Matt's part that Matt literally is completely destroying not only himself, but the possibility of history at all. And he never gets this, which is kind of amazing. Now, that hearsay wouldn't be admissible in a court, and certainly the standard, I would think, for adopting the foundation of a religion is true, to the extent that one is willing to conform one's life to it, should at least rise to the level of surviving courtroom evidentiary standard. But Matt, again, you just said that it's hearsay, right? It's not hearsay. It's multiple testimonies, multiple examples of attestation that far exceed Plato. One might wonder, as I do, if this event actually happened and there's a good and wise God behind it, why did he leave us with such a paucity of anecdotal evidence and place this event in a such a temporal situation as to make it unverifiable? So uh, I love to bring in the point uh, about Jesus's approach to evidences here. In the Gospels, there's a, a, a fascinating instance, right, where the guy goes to Abraham's bosom. He dies and he, he goes to, excuse me, he goes to Hades, but uh, he's not in Abraham's bosom. And he's in the uh, section of the dead, which is torment. And he can see uh, the poor man, right? The story of the rich man and the poor man. He sees the poor man who went to Abraham's bosom, which is the abode of the righteous in um, in the intermediate state in the Old Testament. And he says, you know, I can see my uh, uh, the poor guy over there. And, and he says that he's in Abraham's bosom and he's blessed. And he says, Lord, yeah, the poor, poor man of Lazarus. He says, Lord, let me come back, uh, go back to, uh, to life from the dead and warn my brothers. Because if my brothers see me, rise from the dead they'll believe and they won't come to this terrible place of torment what does jesus say does jesus say oh dude yes all we have to do is pile up a bunch of probabilities about how it's possible that someone rose from the dead and maybe they'll believe uh no actually jesus says the very opposite of everything trent is arguing in his apologetic even though one rise from the dead they will not believe. Let me repeat that, Trent. Even though one rise from the dead, they will not believe. Why? Because evidences are interpreted according to a paradigm. And the amount of evidences that you throw at an unbeliever is not going to really work or do anything until you change his paradigm of evidences. Challenging his presuppositions, you see. <clears throat> because as Jesus points out in that story, in the parable, he says, if they wanted to believe, 
And if they were actually open to the truth, they have Moses and the prophets. So Jesus is basically saying, if you want evidences, one of the greatest, clearest evidences is to go to the prophets, understand the mountains of messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, how they're fulfilled in Christ, and you would have the very thing Matt is asking for, the giant pile of historical attestation, They have Moses and the prophets. If they're not going to investigate Moses and the prophets with an open heart and mind to see this pile of evidence, then they're not going to believe even though one rise from the dead. And unfalsifiable. Because I'd argue that an untestable claim of a matter of fact such as this event occurred, no matter what the event is, can never be reasonably believed unless that matter of fact is wholly mundane and when the risk of being wrong is minimized. So Matt just gave a uh, arbitrary, absurd criteria of what counts as a reasonable belief and what counts as justification for that belief. Um, and there's absolutely no way that Matt could, could make good on what he just said. And what this shows, again, is that this debate isn't about evidences. The debate is actually about the prior question of justification or criteria of evidences, which Trent did bring up at the beginning. But Matt's just like blowing past that, acting like, well, we all know what evidences are and we all know what a courtroom does and we're all just doing the same thing and it's all the same. So if somebody were to say George Washington had a dog named Piggy, the risk of accepting that claim being wrong is fairly trivial. We don't have any way to verify it, as far as I can tell. And it's probably also not falsifiable because we don't have a time machine. We don't have the, the ability to exhaustively explore every aspect of it. But the risk of being wrong is trivial. Oops, I thought George Washington had a dog named Piggy. Uh, it turned I mean, Matt just doesn't even have a conception of the fundamental problems to empiricism, right? I mean... There's so many, and and it's it's if you had an epistemology 101 class, or if you had, you know, some classes in modern philosophy, you would take the classes on the empiricist. You would study Locke, Berkeley, Hume. <coughs> you would get into the questions that they raise, ask, and debate, and then you would have at least a basic knowledge of what the problems of skepticism and empiricism are. Matt does not know that. He will probably never know that because he thinks he knows what he's talking about and he doesn't. And if he did, he would know about the myth of the given, the underdetermination of data. He would know about the external world. He would know about the self. He would know about the problem of universals, right? Plaguing questions for skeptical empiricists, which Matt does not know about, does not care about, and will never talk about. Now, I, I wasn't right. I guess that's not a big deal. Unless maybe you're on a quiz show in front of millions of people and then you suffer terrible embarrassment and a, and a harm to your reputation. Well, remember, this is the guy who thinks that when Jordan Peterson asked him about why life has value, he literally rep replied because a monkey ancestor thought he had value. That was his actual. I'm not joking. It wasn't a joke. It was literally what he thought was a good reply. And I mean, I can kind of see on Trent's face. I'll just show you a little. <laughs> A little, uh, I mean, look at Trent's face here. It's like, Trent's like, are you really arguing this with me right now? Like, dude, seriously? Trent's like, I got this in the bag, bro. <laughs> right? I mean, Matt, this is just so goofy, dude. It's like, I'm not trying to be mean. It's just, bro, come on. And then all of a sudden, believing something like that is a problem. It's important for people to recognize that there's a difference between verification and falsification. Matt, d uh, does he does he not even know that the verificationists and the falsificationists like this is all like people don't do this anymore. Like it's it's like Matt read a couple introductory books and then just ran with it and ignores like dispensed archaic <laughs> epistemological attempts of justification and, and theories of evidences and proofs and knowledge 
that people don't really hold anymore. Uh, but I think maybe the the normie audiences that follow Matt, I mean, if you read the comments under the debate that I have with Matt on his channel and on my channel, like the especially on his channel, like the tier of people, the Reddit tier of the audience that follows Matt, you know, the people that come into the Discord, uh, the atheist crowd, the, the, the people that I was arguing with for five hours the other night on the politics and religion server, like they don't know what an argument is. They don't know what justification is. They don't know what empiricism is. They don't know what Barclay said, what Humes, they have no idea about any of this stuff. So what appeals to them is really these, uh, really these, these low tier analogies, right? These naive assumptions and really naive uh, positions. And, Trent is is an, enough of a philosopher and enough of a good thinker and critical thinker to be way, tears way above this. So, I mean, Matt is so out of his element in these kinds of debates that he doesn't even realize it. That's the sad part here. And because he at least is a good talker, he's at least able to dupe a lot of people who literally know nothing about Philosophy 101 and that's really the only way that he could be successful at this is is that kind of a game. Verification is the notice the notice the note who verification is the concept that we should produce the thing. If we were to say all intelligent beings are on planet Earth, verification you could run around, hey, there's an intelligent being on Earth and there's one on Earth and there Again, I mean, do anybody who has had like a few philosophy classes will like they know the ways that you could critique verificationism, right? or falsification like people don't hold this stuff anymore one on earth and there's one on earth but verifying it exhaustively could be completely impractical because you would have to search every is he not he doesn't understand that the the, the verificationism and these they, they don't actually solve the dilemmas that hume raised do you remember in the debate with matt where i just kept going back to david hume and saying matt everything that you're saying assumes the principles that Hume called into question. Do you have an account for that? And Matt literally just kept saying, I don't care what David Hume said. Like he thought I was appealing to David Hume as an appeal to authority. I'm like, Matt, I'm not appealing to David Hume as an authority. I'm appealing to his argument, dude, really? Are you that slow? Yes, he is. Every planet at all times in order to determine that in fact, all intelligent beings are in fact on planet earth. But falsification is a separate issue. Falsification is whether or not it is theoretically able to be shown to be false. And so while we may never be able to verify- Matt will never grasp that it's the people in his camp, in academia, that ask and repeat the very questions that Matt doesn't understand. That skepticism can't answer. Do you understand that? And the comments, I mean, just dude, the mindlessness of the comments in Matt's on Matt's channel under our debate, none of them, I mean, not none of them, because a lot we actually seen a lot of people convert, but I mean the, the comments that are there, the thousands of comments are like not even grasping this. Do you remember the debate with Stefan Molyneux? Do, do you do you guys see this? From my vantage point, the debate is the same from Matt to Trent to Azrar Rashid, to Stefan Molyneux. I'm asking the same questions to all of these people because all of those people share an a, empiricist starting point. And so anytime they start saying all these things, I'm like, whoa, 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 bro. <laughs> let's dial this back, dude. Whoa, let's dial this back because I want to know about these starting point positions in epistemology that you need to deal with first that human Kant raised before you start doing all this postulating and pontificating. Maybe all of your postulations and pontifications are correct, but you're going to have to answer those prior questions before you go down this long rabbit trail here. And that's what philosophy does. I mean, guys, hello, the last 500 years, the last four or 500 years of philosophy is asking and repeating what I'm saying.
Remember what Dr. Mannion says. Epistemology and its questions have not significantly progressed or changed since Hume and Kant. They're still debating this. So from Hume and Kant to Quine, it's the same questions. Matt doesn't even know those questions. That's how lame and silly this is. I mean, Matt should be laughed off of the stage as as a stage magician. He's not a philosopher. He doesn't know the first thing about philosophy. So the stuff he's talking about is like totally divorced from, from what's actually going on in the last 500 years of philosophy and epistemology. And most of the, the Reddit, you know, internet sphere atheists are that same way, right? Like they're just repeating things that like somebody said in the 1700s. Just as much as Trent and the classical apologists are repeating bad arguments from the 1300s that all intelligent beings are in fact on planet earth we could at least in theory falsify it because if we produced an intelligent being that wasn't on earth that would falsify the claim now that would show that the claim is wrong but if we have I mean, if matt had if matt took if matt took a pist- uh modern philosophy 101 and then took modern epistemology or epistemology 101 he would be at least aware of the critiques of the verification thesis. Claim that is unverifiable, unfalsifiable. It is essentially untestable. And my foundation is that if you have an untestable claim, it had better be mundane, trivial, and consistent with the facts of reality. Uh, before- uh, excuse me. What does it mean for something to be mundane? What does it mean for objects to exist in some kind of consistent, meaningful way with your thoughts? What does it mean for you to know that there's an external world? What does it mean for you to know that these objects have identity over time? I mean, Matt, it's, it is so easy to just destroy Matt. And if you watch, go back and watch the debate that I had with Matt. And all I did was pick a couple of those kinds of basic questions to keep asking Matt. And he never even know, knew what I was asking. You, you should ever risk believing that it is in fact the case. Well, we can't really believe or we can't argue that it's rational to believe something that we can't test at all. And so we do the best we can when it comes to history. And Matt, why should we believe that um, it's rational to believe in rational things? Why should we believe in your theory of reasoning? Why should we believe in the verification thesis? Why should we believe in falsifying things? Right. In other words, these are all assumptions that Matt is using as his starting point, right? That Matt is not going to be able to justify. Let's give an easy example. Matt is a basic bitch empiricist, literally, right? And we saw that in our debate. There's no question about that. That's not a a false... uh, falsely attributing to him a position he doesn't have. And if you remember in the debate, I said, Matt, I heard in previous debates, you say, quote, you should never believe anything without good empirical evidence to support it. Right? Yes, I agree. Matt Matt said that. It's a basic Matt 101 principle, right? That's Matt Dillahunty Epistemology 101. Matt, do you think that proposition itself is part of your sense data no it's not and so over and over i i hammered at these kinds of points matt uh everything that you're saying about science presupposes induction what is the justification for believing in the principle of induction it just is so matt says it just is that i'm not joking that's his argument it just is that's arbitrary that's ad hoc that's not a justification it's not an argument it's circular on matt's own theory of circularity and argumentation right and matt says you can't give an account or a justification for presuppositions they just are which is not true but that's his that was his reply so wait a minute so matt you're saying we should believe in things that we don't have empirical data and justification for but you earlier said don't believe anything without good empirical evidence and justification total contradiction when we take a look at history all we have are reports somebody said they saw this somebody said they knew this person somebody said this other thing 
That's all well and good when we're trying to put together the best understanding of history we can, but we shouldn't be proclaiming it as truth, and we shouldn't necessarily be saying that this particular version of history is particularly reasonable, because history tends to be written by the victors. And so history is always suspect. And there are two quotes from David Hume that are the... I mean, this goober doesn't even know David Hume's argumentation. I mean, I... He's just quote mining. I guarantee you he's not ever read that. He wouldn't be able to understand David Hume if you read it. Because I asked him multiple times arguments that Hume makes. And he, he acted like it doesn't matter. Uh, David Hume is not an authority for me. Dude, I'm not appealing to David Hume as an authority. I explicitly said multiple times his argument. But this obtuse dude acted like that that's not what I was doing and he probably knew better right but he got flustered in that debate and was just demolished cornerstone of how and why I go about determining if something is or should be considered reasonable the first one is that the he said the wise man proportions his belief to the evidence and all he's really saying is your confidence level in the truth of a claim should be proportional to the evidence that is there to support it you barely have any evidence for. And similarly, if there's mountains of evidence of something and you're just like, well, you know, then you're not proportioning your confidence to the belief. Uh, this is so like, I mean, how does anybody follow this dude? Like this is, this is like embarrassing level opening statement. I hope Trent really just demolished the evidence. Sorry. The second quote from you, which I'll go ahead and read because it's a little lengthy. When anyone tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it be more probable that this person should either deceive... So again, if Christianity is true, then it's not probable. It's the only rational position to say that Jesus rose from the dead. Right? Because the beliefs in the set of beliefs in our system all relate to and determine one another. There's no belief within the Christian system that is somehow more self-evident or more obvious per se than the other beliefs considered as a set of beliefs. They all go together. This is why you can't like take one belief out and be like, oh, well, I believe in Christianity, but not God's omniscience. Well, that's not Christianity anymore, right? That's some other thing, some heresy. Because Christianity is the set of orthodox beliefs i mean it's not reduced to that but i'm saying in terms of the system that's what it is expressed as so are we starting to see the point here that like it's not a debate about this fact versus that fact the debate is two paradigms two worldviews that are incommensurate so, wait a minute, if they're incommensurate, how would we determine between the two? Ah, exactly. Which of these paradigms gives an account for not just evidences, but the theory of evidence at all? The possibility of evidence at all? Possibility of logic at all? The possibility of ethics at all? The possibility of meaning at all? Which are prior questions to metaphysics. Or be deceived or that the fact which in he relates should have actually happened. I weigh the one miracle against the other, and according to the superiority which I discover, I pronounce my decision and always reject the greater miracle. Now, what Hume is essentially saying there is, is it more probable that someone is has either been deceived or is intending to deceive me than- It sounds like after my our debate, uh, Matt went and tried to learn David Hume, <laughs> right? I mean. You can tell that after our debate, Matt was shook up because he had to call in Ozzy and Dr. Malpass to help him out and to help him feel better and to help him understand my argument. Literally, like he didn't understand it. And so he called them in as backup to save his, you know, him because they have actually no philosophy. Uh, and so it sounds like since then, Matt was like, maybe I should go read this David Hume guy because he's supposed to be like, you know, the guru daddy of my skepticism. But... Matt still doesn't understand David Hume, which is the, the hilarious part, right? I mean, this guy is just like a, a self-owning meme generator. The claim is true. And when he says reject the greater miracle, that is... Remember, Matt's greatest argument. 
my life has value because monkey thought it had value. There's a monkey ancestor who decided life has value. That was Matt's reply to Jordan Peter. This is the, the most well-known internet atheist person. His argument, I'm not kidding. Go listen to the Jordan Peterson Dillahunty debate. Jordan Peter, why does life have value? Why do you think it has value? Why does your life have value? My life has value because monkey ancestors thought it had value. He's not joking. That's what he says. Dude, if 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 you as an atheist believe that, you are monkey. That is incredibly important and and, and significant to understand. That's actually the Hume best argument for accept the lesser miracle. Atheism. Like somebody asked me the other day, what's the best argument for atheism? The atheist arguments are so bad that they almost convince me we're monkeys or they're monkeys at least. And so therefore evolution and atheism might be true because those dudes are so bad. That's the best. The best argument for atheism is the stupidity of the atheist, which make me think that humanity is completely stupid. That is not it at all. It is reject the greater miracle. It's, it's not, it doesn't just say, Oh, here's two potential uh, candidate explanations that we have at this particular moment in time. Throw the one out that's more ridiculous and accept the other one. No, it's just you should throw out the one that's more ridiculous. And so if we're hearing a claim that someone rose from the dead, when we have no evidence that this sort of thing is possible or probable, then the greater miracle is that someone rose. From well, no, wait a minute. No evidence that is possible or probable. Again, actually, Trent did give some considerations as to how it might be possible or probable. So now I, I, I'm not going to go down this evidentialist goofy line of argumentation, but I mean, Matt, you should at least maybe, the, maybe there's rebuttals coming where Matt will respond. I don't know, but I mean, that's not really what, I mean, Trent did at least give some examples or cases, which I think would re at least somewhat respond to what Matt, Matt's asking for here. The dead versus that someone was deceived or that someone was in I mean Matt does this thing where it's like you give your statement you say a bunch of stuff Matt asks a bunch of questions and and acts like you never said anything and just kind of ignores all the stuff that you said that's like a classic Matt thing being to deceive uh that someone was mistaken nobody has to lie for any of this they can just be wrong, or we can just have stories that don't accurately represent the facts at the time. So if a claim isn't fals falsifiable and there's no way to show it's wrong, we can't reasonably accept that it's correct. And if we're left with no physical evidence about the existence of Jesus or the interactions of Jesus or his death and resurrection, what we're left with- By the way, I highly recommend, as I, po I posted this week, if, if you read the Russ Mannion paper, uh, contingency of knowledge, which I posted as a kind of a classic presentation of tag. Um, then you know that Russ, Dr. Manya had a, a good section responding to the, the nonsense that Matt's talking about right here. And he points out the inadequacy of verification and falsification. Testimony. Now, I'm not willing to dig in on whether or not the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses. I don't think they were. I don't think that it most reasonable scholars aren't going to say these are eyewitnesses, but it doesn't matter to me because even if they were all eyewitnesses, we already know that eyewitness testimony is unreliable under the best circumstances. In this case, we don't know whose testimony, eyewitness second or third hand. We can't investigate it at all. The things that they say happened don't have corroborating evidence. They don't have supporting physical evidence. We don't. So again, not true. Uh, there are multiple uh, extra biblical attestations to all kinds of events in the New Testament. For example, uh, Josephus's writings about the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, those aren't corroborations of everything in the Bible, but they are extra canonical corroborations of things in the Bible. So this is just patently false on a on a basic level in terms of just historical claims. Any way to question them about their reliability. We don't have any way to uh, talk to them to determine, you know, are these stories accurate? Are, you know, do they overlap? What we do know is that the the Easter narrative uh, from the different Gospels does not line up and cannot be reconciled with the different accounts of it. But in the absence of any physical evidence, we're left with uh, assessing the nature of the claim and the nature of the reports. If it's an extraordinary claim, and it needs to be an extraordinary claim, 
uh, as it would be really remarkable to see. I mean, if Christianity is true, the resurrection isn't an extraordinary claim. I mean, what you consider extraordinary or mundane is actually going to be determined by your worldview and criteria as a whole. So uh, this is just begging the question, Matt, because what's in dispute is actually the truth or falsity of Christianity, which both of these parties don't seem to realize that. They think it's a debate over a fact of the resurrection. No, what's in dispute is worldviews as a whole. Uh, so, no, Matt, it's begging the question to say that it's an extraordinary claim when that's the thing that's in question, right? If, if Christianity is true, it's not extraordinary. It's a fundamental fact of reality. The resurrection is the most fundamental fact of all of reality. I mean, St. Maximus even says that, right? All of reality is basically unified and transfigured in the cross, right? In its cosmological recapitulatory significance. So, <laughs> I mean, again, they don't understand that this debate is actually prior to the question of evidences. Jesus ate figs for our salvation. Uh, the claim needs to be extraordinary because of the narrative. So, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Oh, wait a minute. Is that actually true? Everybody's heard that. I've said it. Other people have said it. I accept that aphorism for what it means, but not as it's written, because all claims require sufficient evidence. And then, and what, what, all claims require sufficient evidence. Matt, is it true that that claim requires sufficient evidence? And what is the sufficient evidence from you as a basic bitch empiricist that all claims require sufficient evidence? Oh, that's right. That's David Hume 101, and you can't do that. This is sufficient evidence to believe a claim is going to differ based on how consistent that claim is with reality. Monday it's begging the question, as if you have some a priori, uh, easy, self-evident, clear access to reality. Does this goober not understand that to say that claims have to match up to reality is a gigantic metaphysical claim? And this goober doesn't even believe in metaphysics. In claims benefit from having a common pool of knowledge and evidence within reality. We uh, this is so uh, mindless, dude. I mean, I don't. I, I don't think he could actually make it. This dude could not pass a metaphysics class. So he doesn't even know what he's talking about. Like he's, he's trying to argue about claims as if they don't have metaphysical content, saying that facts have to match up to reality. Dude, do you understand that when you say reality, you have entered into the domain of metaphysics. Matt doesn't even know what metaphysics is, right? He doesn't even realize he's in the domain of metaphysics. And to do this, you now have a whole lot of work to do because you're an empiricist, bro. A skeptic? An empiricist skeptic? And now you're making grand claims about facts matching reality? Again, totally ignorant of the last four or 500 years of philosophy, which would laugh at him precisely at that very point you don't have you don't get a privileged access to reality bro until you answer the claim the challenges of human con well, that figs exist we know that dogs exist we know that people name their dog no that's precisely what you don't know you don't know that figs exist dogs exist fig that these claims have any meaning or import or connect to anything in the external world matt that's what david hume points out which you tried to quote David Hume. You don't even get the dude you're quoting. He's quote, he's critiquing you, Matt. Don't you understand? David Hume is the consistent skeptic who's critiquing you, Goober. It's funny things, and it's not extraordinary to think that somebody might name their dog Piggy. We know that figs exist and are eaten, so it's not extraordinary to claim that Jesus ate a fig unless... Jesus didn't exist or figs weren't around at that time. Although we have in the Bible uh, what is a, a strange claim of Jesus cursing a fig tree for not producing figs when it wasn't in season, which I would argue isn't something that a, a divine uh, entity uh, knowledgeable about figs and fruit seasons would do. And it seems bizarre. This goober doesn't understand the fig tree represents Israel. I mean, wow, this guy is like 
he's did he really just argue that God wouldn't curse a fig tree because he should know as a divine being that figs don't bloom? So he thinks that Jesus cursed the fig tree because there weren't figs. He doesn't even understand the fig tree represents Israel and the curses. Oh, wow, well, man, this guy is something else. They curse a fig tree, but I can't say whether or not that actually happened. Maybe it didn't happen and it's just there to teach another lesson. I have a hard time going through some of these things and saying, yes, that's, that's being reported as this actually happened. Uh, that is a big problem. I have a hard time. I don't see. I have a hard time. Matt, that is a descriptor of a psychological state. You're uh, reporting to us psychological states of affairs. Um, that's cool, bro. Nothing to do with a debate or an argument. So what evidence do we have? Copies of copies of translations of copies from unknown sources that may have been, but probably weren't eyewitnesses. And even if they had been eyewitnesses, it wouldn't be sufficient to confirm that someone actually rose from the dead. What sort of evidence would we expect for a claim where someone rose from the dead? It depends on the time frame. Sure, back in first century Judea, probably not a lot. How, you don't have a way to test for sure that somebody's dead. You don't have like x-rays, you don't have DNA. Well, what's, but the question is, if the story is true, then Jesus was divine and God exists. And what sort of evidence could a God provide? Well, a God could provide the best evidence possible, such that there would be no reasonable debate to be had at all. Well, this is just assuming that there's no fall and that uh, all men are rational and they just believe whatever the best evidences are presented. Uh, no, that's not true, right? I mean, if the Christian story is true, then part of that doctrine is the fall. And a corollary of the doctrine of the fall is that men don't believe what is true just willy-nilly because they should. They, in fact, rebel against the truth, right? They suppress the truth in unrighteousness and they don't come to the light lest their deeds be exposed, Romans 1, John 3. So, no, it, it doesn't follow from the fact that just because God exists, uh, he should and ought to and would therefore make everybody just clearly believe on the basis of clear public evidence. There is clear public evidence. That was Jesus's point in the parable. But even though one rises from the dead, they still won't believe. Trent, hello, you hear this? Even though one rises from the dead, they still won't believe. Even though you convince Matt of the resurrection of the dead, he still won't believe. Theists often claim that it's more believable because it's a miracle. It's more believable because the first people to the tomb were women and women weren't trusted. Um, Matt, that's not what Trent's argument was. Theists often argue, that wasn't Trent's argument. Why, that straw man, dude. Uh, are you replying to Trent or are you replying to a bunch of other people who aren't there? Nobody would put these details in, so therefore they must be true. But that's like saying, you know, that's exactly what the butler... Uh, that's Trent didn't make this argument. So uh, Matt does this all the time, too, where he responds to straw men that his opponent isn't making. Say if he did do it. If it's on par or worse than the evidence offered by someone trying to sell me a bridge, someone trying to get me started in their uh, as their underling in a multi-level marketing campaign, or the money that my Nigerian prince has set aside for me, then the evidence isn't strong and no amount of pretending will change that. It is... So another problem here, crackers in the pantry fallacy, right? This is the assumption that all things are proven and known in the same way. Uh, I immediately called this out with Matt. He didn't understand what I was saying. He still doesn't understand this. I even asked Matt if he agreed that everything is proven in the same way. And he said, no, some things are proven in different ways. And yet here is Matt going back to the same stupid argument as if everything is proven in the same way. Just put some empirical evidence in front of me and then it will be probable or improbable. But Matt, I pointed out that there's all kinds of things that we believe in that are not demonstrable empirically that you believe in, such as presuppositions. And Matt said, there's no argument for presuppositions. They just are. Okay, but Matt, you said don't believe in anything unless there's empirical evidence for it. Matt's philosophy is garbage and nonsense. It is total incoherent, make it up on the spot bullshit. Unreasonable to believe it because there isn't sufficient evidence. No physical evidence. Nothing about this claim would pass muster today. There's no body, no tomb, no blood, no sword, no cross, no DNA, no burial record. Uh, Matt, uh, I don't, I'm not going to grant you any of that because you don't have a, cons uh, a theory of evidences at all. You don't have a, co theory, uh, a coherent theory or justification for proof at all. 
for knowledge at all, for evidence at all, for meaning at all, for sentences at all. Despite the fake shroud of Turin, no witnesses to question currently, no crime scene investigators, no findings of fact at all. I understand and appreciate as I'm a Imagine being so philosophically naive that you think that there's just this thing called facts. <laughs> like, like there's just like uninterpreted brute data and you just go look at it and then it's the ah, uh, it's the fact, right? Like I look over here at the chalk.com and like look at the fact, right? The fact, 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 the fact. Not fact, not fact, not fact, right? Like the like the the ask yourself level stuff here, right? I mean, this is the level of they're all on the same level. These people, like that's how they all think. Uh, and I want to remind you that if you don't want to think at that low level, right? What do we what we what do we be doing around these parts? We be doing the daily. We be doing the seven wonders now. So it's a wonder of the seven wonders. That's how I'm able to do this. How was I able? to talk for multiple hours yesterday uh, or the day before multiple hours again today on discord and then also come here and do this energetic response multiple hours chalk.com baby and they are of course the official sponsor of jay's analysis they are one of our key sponsors if you go over there right now uh you can become a uh, magical, energetic argument boy like me. If you want that argument fire like I've got, how do I argument with such fire? Chalk.com helps me out. That's how they do it. She legit. It's legit. Go right there. Promo code J40. 40% off anything. We don't know how long they're going to have all these supplies due to the supply chain shocks of Klaus and the World Economic Forum and all their goober, goon, minion operations. This is an anti-soy operation we got going here, right? We're talking about guys committed to fighting Gil Bates, Klaus, and the soy army. How do we do that? With chalk.com. No, I'm still taking Tonkat. I had to take a break. So you can't take like a bunch of chalk at once. So you have to kind of cycle it. So I took a break from the Tonkat to do Seven Wonders and the Daily. And then, as I said, I'm going to do this, the Irish Moss later. But Irish Moss is good for the for the ladies, ladies, and just even the i the idea, the sound of Irish Moss. I mean, doesn't that just sound kind of more like a girl? Leprechauns, Moss. I think of women. Irish Irish Moss, laddies. The lassies love the Irish Moss. Anyway, I don't know where I got that, but. That's what we do around here. It's all improv. It's all on the spot. The Tongcat uh, Boost Tea, naturally. Proven in studies. Go check it out. They have hundreds, 500, 600 five-star reviews. Go read on chalk.com. Um, they got booted from Instagram because they're based. There you go. What else do you need to know? They're a red pill-based company. And they're my boys. So again, if you want to support this show, you want to support me, you got to do it by supporting our sponsors. And Chalk.com is an official Jay's Analysis sponsor. So you know they're good dudes. Former believer that there are testimonies here that people find compelling. And I, I could probably speculate as to what it is that convinces people. and what The fact that Matt is a former believer and the fact that Matt doesn't find things convincing is totally irrelevant to a debate. Do you remember this? The great example of this is the Bonson Tabosh debate, right? This it's a classic because Tabosh keeps doing this as if it's an argument, right? He keeps saying, "I find it hard to believe that a god would do this. I find it hard to believe that God made it the case that this is how it is." And what does Bonson constantly say? Ah, uh, that's just a reporting of a psychological state. It's not an argument, uh, Doctor Tabosh. That's not an argument. Dr. DeBosch, that isn't an argument. Matt doesn't understand that reporting psychologically descriptive states about what he finds convincing and doesn't find convincing isn't an argument. And that shows that Matt doesn't really know what arguments are. Is that keeps people in belief, but it is not the physical evidence. It is not what is reasonable. Yeah, the psychological motivations for why people believe or don't do not believe this or that isn't also isn't an argument. 
it is probably the extraordinary narrative, the emotive, uh, the, the emotion that people feel and connect with it. I mean, I could have a psychological motivation to believe something that happens to be true. And I can have a psychological motivation to believe something that actually happens to be false. So psychological motivations don't have anything to do with what's true or false. Fear of finding out you are wrong, fear of dying and not going on to an eternal paradise, fear of being the odd one out when everybody around you believes. I have experienced those same concerns for the Christians out there. Again, Matt doesn't matter. Like none of this is an argument. So does Matt understand what a debate is like? It's like he's doing the reverse version of an evangelical testimony, right? Like the evangelicals, I just want to talk about how my life was in shambles and like I, I prayed and Jesus came to me and like if you're out there and if you're hurting. This is the reverse version of that where Matt thinks that giving his atheist testimony and, and deconversion story counts as an argument. No, it doesn't. Who believe this. And you believe all kinds of supernatural things. And many of you believe in demons and uh, angels and all of the things that go along with this because you've accepted the supernatural. The only reason this feels reasonable to people is because they've already accepted other things that aren't reasonable to accept. We have no way currently to investigate or confirm the supernatural at all. We can't confirm. So this, again, relies on a specific presupposition and rabid doctrine of what counts as investigation proof and evidences and until matt shows us that we should believe that everything should be believed on the basis of empirical sense data then we're not going to listen to matt but matt can't prove that everything has to be demonstrable by sense data because that's impossible and it's a contradiction that anything supernatural exists we can't confirm that anything supernatural interacts with reality and to say that well, we've seen the writings of these people who we don't know, we can't investigate from a long time ago. And it's just so darn extraordinary. And we can't think of a better explanation than it likely happened. Therefore, it's reasonable to believe it. I cannot get on board with that. And it frustrates me. That's the only little area where I will give Matt a point because I do agree that really the weakness in Trent's, you know, evidential spiel throughout the middle of his opening statement, it doesn't lead me to think that I, there's any necessary reason to connect this to Christianity or that if, even if Jesus rose from the dead, that that's supposed to on your already existing evidentialist bases, why is that supposed to get me to accept Christianity? It's a non sequitur. It's only a sequitur it only follows if christianity is true but that's the thing that's in question so i'll give matt one point just at this point that other people can't see this because if i were to come to you with the story like this today if it didn't have the history and the baggage of, not of of actually being true but of being convincing enough to foster a bunch of followers nobody would reasonably ex all right let me take that back almost nobody would would argue that they could reasonably accept it today and many of the people who are accepting these sorts of claims um, are also at odds with science. And it frustrates me that someone could, I don't know, fear getting a vaccine. Oh, here we go. So, so uh, Matt's account of science and disagreeing with science and disagreeing with what he takes to be the majority view, which is how he began, I remember, is like, what's reasonable to believe Matt seemed to connect to the majority of what is considered reasonable, which that itself is absurd and arbitrary and inco incoherent. There's no, there's no reason, there's no way that we know prima facie what the majority position necessarily is. That begs the question, why should we accept the majority position? Um, there've been many cases where the majority of people believe something completely ridiculous. Matt himself admits this when he thinks admits that most people in the world have some view of theism or the the supernatural so most people consider it rational to believe in the supernatural therefore on matt's own grounds it should be reasonable to believe in this this is just so silly like matt is just totally matt has no self-awareness like he's not totally incapable of self-reflection and understanding 
the pure garbage nonsense that he spits out for fear of being microchipped or it being the mark of the beast while they accept claims that don't have good evidence so um he threw in his little uh, uh scientism affirmation and i guess he's gonna learn the hard way but uh yeah that was interesting that he threw that in at the end there but um yeah i mean does matt know anything about the history of science and scientific abuse and the countless instances and examples where science was rife with fraud with um experimentation no uh but those things are historical facts even in matt's own admission they would be recent recent history well it, let's uh, he's not interested in that he's interested in a pragmatic low iq basic bitch idea that if you just follow the majority of science, like the t-dump stuff like the the, the level of stuff that t-dump says right where it's true because most scientists say it are you serious number one that's a that's a fallacy dummy <laughs> like it's not, nothing is true because a bunch of people think it all right thank you matt thank you trent those were two excellent uh, opening statements I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an executive decision here, if that's okay. We kind of did agree a, a, upon it before the, the debate began, even though there was... I will admit, uh, really, that's all atheists have, is um, rhetoric and storytelling. Um, the appeal to emotion, I mean, the master of that is uh, freaking, what's his name? Sam Harris, right? When we, we did multiple deconstructions of Sam Harris. I mean, like, literally the whole presentation of sam harris is emotional appeals like that's it these people don't like do they not know what fallacies i don't think they do i really don't think that they understand that you can't do fallacies in a debate and a skilled debater will just call them out um trent's a pretty skilled debater so i really hope that he calls out a lot of this just nonsense from matt confusion what i'd like to do is do two eight minute cross examinations um, this and then open good. it up to just kind of 20 minute general chat between the two of you because well, I, I think that well man i remember well so this is gonna get confusing <laughs> frad i remember dillahunty <laughs> i don't sounds weird to do that like i'm a sergeant or something i remember <laughs> dillahunty saying um that uh the original email only said just 30 to 45 minute discussion which i don't know you i guess you're you're in charge but i'm fine with whatever the original said that you're Hey, you're the host. The, the, the reason I like the idea of you guys beginning with eight minute cross examinations, it'll put one of you in the driver's seat to kind of drill into the points the other was making. And you can be rude during that time. You can you can cut them off. You can press them. Uh, oh, wait, what? Whoa, 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 whoa. Matt Fraz says you're allowed to interrupt, be rude, cut them off. Whoa, whoa, whoa. wait a minute. I thought that was the reason I'm a bad guy. So, um, Pints with Aquinas, Matt Frad, it's a, a double standard. So, if I do those things, I'm bad. When Matt allows it on his channel for his people, it, no, nothing wrong with that. Totally cool. Uh, have at it, bro. Do you see that this the constant, just total double standard of the Roman Catholics? Like, how long can they milk this and keep this up, right? I mean, Lofton and his goober crew are three years into whining and crying about me being mean three years ago. These are the Crusaders, right? The sons of the Crusading Knights are three years into whining and crying about me being mean three years ago. And here's Matt Frad, who, of course, said, what, a year ago, I, which I don't give a crap about his channel. I don't, I don't even, I wouldn't even go on there. But he made it explicit that he would never host someone like me on his channel. So I'm a toxic person. But here's Matt saying, um, in the cross-examination, you can be rude. You can cut them off. Dude, this is such just lame hypocrisy. I mean, th these guys are like paper tigers, dude. It's just... It's so fake and gray. And then maybe oh, you're trying that. to give me a little give me a little leeway here. <laughs> I, I come in with a reputation. 
<laughs> well, see, that'll be good. Well, you'll have eight minutes to just sort of be full Matt Dillahunt. Matt, how is it that it's cool to be rude and cut people off when it's like an atheist? But if I do it, I'm a bad person. Literally, this guy thinks I'm a toxic person because of the very things that he just said Matt can do. I mean, this guy is a total hypocrite, dude. It'll be great. I, I, I'm fine with whatever. Tear me up, Trent. Okay, well, I'd like to. I think we do. We'll do that if, and then we'll go into twenty minutes. Just the two of you can chat, and um, we'll see how civil and logical we can both be. Um, but before we do that, I want to say, uh, Jay Dyer would never come on my channel. I would never host a toxic personality. I feel hurt and ashamed. I wept many nights, many years. I filled my whole beer stein full of me tears because Jay Dyer hurt me feelings. I would never, ever allow any of that toxic personality to toxify my channel. My channel is a place of love, a place of honour, a place of healing, a place of me sucking on fat cigars, drinking cake icing directly out of a beer stein, giving that over to Ibarra, sharing beer steins full of cake icing with Eric Ibarra. And I would just never, ever, ever, ever Eva, allow Jay Dyer here, because the, the goal of Pints of Aquinas is to fill those pints full of cake icing and to build back better. Build back better. By the way, Matt, if you'd like to get rude, if you'd like to maybe even say a no-no naughty word, perhaps even the S word, feel free. A big thank you to our sponsor. Du, 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 du. I'm going to skip past this. The, the one who is doing the cross-examining uh, is, is welcome to interrupt the other debater, to press them, to cut them off. And that's Dude, what? are you sure? I mean, we might have a, a hurt feeling if we, if, we, if, we, if we allow this toxicity on our channels, Matt. Are we sure you want to do that? I mean, this, this could lead to tears it could lead to to people going on eating binges perhaps abara did this many times after uh, our i heard this i was so mean right i mean are you sure you want to allow this toxicity matt i mean this is like we're in dangerous territory we're in the freaking danger zone right i went to the danger zone matt is literally getting like edge lord danger zone here i mean we might even have like we literally might have hurt feelings. I've got hurt feelings. Tears of a rapper. I mean, whoa, dude. Whoa. Dial it back here, right? Dial it back. This isn't considered being rude. This is just so that the debaters can ask questions uh, regarding the opening statements, I suppose, that, that were just made. Uh, and so we'll start with... Yeah, but if I do that, I'm so evil. I mean, it's just unbelievable the level of just the the depths of evil that i would that i would resort to eight minutes for trent to cross-examine matt and then matt will have eight minutes so trent whenever you're ready sure um and matt just for common ground i also am irked by christians who deny basic aspects of science i am very irked at those who deny the efficacy of vaccines the, the fact the universe is billions of years old uh, I, so for find common ground, you I share your frustration. I want to. Ooh. Hmm. Trent, you just uh, you went down a few notches in my respect for you because this is uh, this is this is getting into the really normie tier stuff. And I mean, I know that this is not tomorrow's topic, but <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, there's a whole other domain. Um, that everybody here knows I cover, which I cover on Lord Voldemort's show, uh, once every week or so, right? The fourth hour. And, you know, that's gone on for a year now. And as I'm sure everybody over here knows, uh, when we do that, we get to speak to millions of people. And that's a great, awesome blessing thing. I'm, I love it. I'm very honored. I'm so happy to be able to speak to millions of people. And the other thing that that domain allows is that I get to talk to and interact with a lot of 
very intelligent, very professional people too in a lot of different domains. And so this lame normie like bro buddy fest of oh please matt i hope you don't think i'm a fundamentalist <laughs> i love science too bro and, and I, I shun anyone who would be so brazen as to embrace a conspiracy theory i would never do that i would never do that you know, a big point, a big part of why that sphere of Matt Fraud and his crew won't and don't want to have anything to do with me is actually over those issues. So let's remember, it's not just an issue of debates uh, about theology and philosophy. There's geopolitical things that play into this. And the irony here is that some of those people in that crew have actually had people on that wrote the books that I cover like David Wimhoff. Now I'm just saying that, okay, if we're going to have a bridge of common ground, uh, a lot of the people from your goober crew have interviewed uh, David Wimhoff. I've lectured through and talked about the totality of that gigantic book. And it's part of my global elite book series. Now I have been and lectured through over 50 of these writings I speak to millions of people a week about these writings. The people that I speak to include people at the White House, people in intelligence agencies, people in foreign governments who listen to you know who. So for you goobers to act like you are in some privileged normie position, you're not. And you don't know what you're talking about. And I would decimate and demolish and destroy every one of you on any of these other topics too so let's get that very clear i i oh i would love one of you goobers to step up and debate me on the geopolitical stuff i will i will demolish you now father damick says don't say demolish a, a person in a debate i'm not literally saying i'm gonna beat him up dude i'm not literally being mean that's called rhetoric rhetoric is part of debate but I just want to tell these guys who are so full of themselves. I think they're so intellectual and they're so superior, so sophisticated. You don't even know what you don't know. And I, I, I really wish one of you guys would step up and debate on something other than the theology. Because when it comes to the topic of the geopolitical issues that all of these three goobers right here just touched on. I will demolish you. I will destroy you. You won't last five minutes in a debate with me over the geopolitical stuff. Now, I'm happy and, and it's great. We're going to have a good time tomorrow night. Definitely, it's going to be civil. We're going to get on the topics of, you know, natural theology, epistemology. That's great. Dude, I, none of you would last five minutes. I will make you look ridiculous because I know for a fact from what I've already heard, not only are the people in this discussion totally ignorant of philosophy, except for Trent. Trent is not ignorant of philosophy. When it comes to geopolitics, these dudes would cry. I will make them cry if they debated me on this topic. They wouldn't last five minutes, guaranteed. Please, please, Matt. Please, Trent. Please, other Matt. <laughs> please, any of you Roman Catholic goobers, I will debate you on the geopolitics. In fact, Guess what? I could probably get you to come debate on Lord Voldemort's channel. Millions of people will watch the debate. I can set that up. I, I please, any of you goobers, please come debate me. And you can have an audience of millions. Matt Frad thinks that he's like this snobby, like so superior, you know, guy. Dude, I when I go on Lord Voldemort's show, I talk to 10 times what you have. Matt, would you please come discuss on Lord Voldemort's show with me? Would you like to have a debate? I'm talking about Matt Frad here or Matt Dillhunty or Trent. Because you guys are you guys are stepping over into another domain where I will get fierce. I'm ready to to demolish you. And that would go for anybody. Any of you normie supporters of the norminess, please, 
please come debate me on the fourth hour. Be reasonable with my beliefs. And frankly, there are Catholics even who believe things about the Catholic faith that, that I don't share because I believe they're being unreasonable. So, um, okay, here are a few questions Thanks. I have. Okay, but uh, I mean, Matt doesn't care about this, right? Like, the, the the more that we try to placate and try to oh Matt please uh, uh, please I believe in theistic evolution I believe in Big Bang <laughs> but please I believe in the stabbies please don't think I'm irrational Matt please don't think I'm a fundamental who cares what this goober thinks do you not I mean the whole posture of this debate is like cucking to the atheist <laughs> that's the point here right like who cares what this goober thinks this goober can't give an account for anything. You said something really interesting. You said 2,000 years ago, it could be reasonable for someone to believe in geocentrism because that's just how the world appeared. That's the way the evidence was. Did I hear that right? Well, I don't know. If, I don't know. I don't know if I tied that to 2,000 years ago. At some point in the it? past, it was reasonable. It, all, all of the best evidence, the most reasonable conclusion was that the Earth orbited the sun. Yes. Yeah, I'm just saying because, like 500 years ago, people believe that's when we. 2,000 years ago is pretty pretty uniform. Okay, so if that's the case, then is it reasonable for people to live according to this motto? Uh, things are as they appear unless evidence shows otherwise. No. What would so, you consider faulty about that kind of uh, way of approaching the world? It, it is, it's one of those things that I would say is probably generally true. And by the way, thanks for thanks for the the comment earlier. I, I'm not. I don't want to take any any of your time up, but it's been frustrating to me to watch people who uh, deny vaccines and COVID and all that stuff. But so oh, Matt, we're so worried about the the frustrations and the dane and the, and the, and how much it pains you to see people be anti science. I mean, um, uh, do you, uh, I better stop or else I'm gonna I, I am gonna actually get mean if I don't stop now. <laughs> right. So like. Matt Fried doesn't want anybody to don't want anybody to be mean on my channel. Don't be mean, Forsters. <laughs> right. Don't be mean ever, Forsters here. Don't be mean. But I'm about to get mean, so we better stop. To say things are as they appear unless evidence shows otherwise is the sort of truism that feels right and may be a good kind of starting rule. But we already have at this point in human history a good understanding of how how we can be fooled optical illusions let's say and mirages we know those sorts of things exist and so now i would say that um while generally speaking um we should look so this is cross-examination i'm detecting filibustering here right matt wants to blab and like you know not let trent corner him which i don't blame him because i'm sure trent will demolish him but matt's just blabbing which i think he's just filibustering trust our senses and how things first appear um we have to do so tentatively with the knowledge that we might well, be unless ev evidence shows us how things appear that's not the way they are well the, the the it's one thing to say i'm convinced that this is likely to be the case and it's another thing to say i think this is the case and what i worry about is that this statement would be cool. like oh i'm right and rationally justified until you prove okay. me wrong well, and that's not the way okay, let's go Let's go to the meat of this. Um, okay. I've fill in the blank. The belief in Jesus' resurrection is unreasonable because, and I tried to, I think you put down multiple things. At the very beginning, you said something like, it's unreasonable because it's not consistent with what we know to be true or in accord with reality. Is there a way you could give me like a one or two sentence if that's correct or more needs to be added on? Belief in the resurrection is unreasonable because... I caught at the beginning not consistent with what we know to be true. A reasonable belief has to be consistent with what we know to be true, is what you said earlier. Uh, at, the, at the closing uh, of my opening, it was it's not reasonable to believe because there isn't sufficient evidence. There isn't physical evidence. There's you know, not. So I don't know if this None of this we just video have testimonial accounts. Me. Okay. Um, but part of it is. Uh... Looks like there's some internet slippage going on here. So let me refresh the page. 38 in. We're, I don't think we're going to make it through this whole debate, but I don't think this is. This debate doesn't isn't going to go that long. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be over pretty quick. 
because I think Matt's about to get rent, rent pretty bad. So direction clear. For some reason, the video keeps freezing, so I don't know what's going on here. Is am I still coming through to you guys, or is the is it getting choppy? Have you investigated? Okay. okay, here we go. Let me go back. Reasonably, because there isn't sufficient evidence, there isn't physical evidence. There's you know, not none of this. We just have okay. testimonial accounts. Okay, um, but part of it is um, you. You also said that um, it's like it's an extraordinary event because resurrections don't happen they've never been confirmed right okay how many resurrection claims have you investigated well just from the bible we have jesus's lazarus's and then all of the saints who rose up out of their graves and marched on jerusalem in the middle of it um hmm. uh, i find no compelling evidence for any of those uh there was a okay. resurrection in, um, in, oh i'm sorry well, I think Craig, right um were you alluding I'm, I'm curious if you have how many re, how just i'm the question is just how many resurrection claims outside of the bible have you investigated to see if this does happen well i don't know what we're going to call investigating i saw a youtube video that purported to be of a resurrection but it it there was no way to investigate it if there's no way to look into the details of the claim beyond the claim itself I don't know what investigation can happen. I don't know how to investigate something that took supposedly there, well, took place. In Craig Keener's two volume work on miracles, he lists about 600 resurrection claims. I think about 500 of them are, you know, at least more than 500 are non are outside of the Bible. Let's say only 5% of them, you know, you 30 of them, you could contact witnesses or things like that. Um, it seems like, I don't know who Craig Keener is, but I don't, if I was Matt, I would be like, I, I don't, I mean, as a skeptic, I don't care that some guy has a book that claims to have 500 resurrections, right? I mean, why would I accept this over any other book that has claims of resurrection? So I, I'm not saying that I necessarily disagree with where, I'm, I'm waiting to see where Trent's going with this, but I know if I was Matt, what I would say there are these claims of resurrection out there so is your answer to the question how many resurrection claims outside of the bible have you investigated the answer is one by watching a youtube video <laughs> um so I, I don't know how this is remotely relevant because i what well, i was you, trying you, to say is i'm mm -hmm. well it's relevant matt because you're saying that the resurrect like resurrections don't happen it's an extraordinary event it's not consistent with reality and that's a yes. claim and you but i'm wondering what's the evidence for that claim now this is a good point i like where he's going because i mean obviously trent's not a presuppositionalist but it's kind of in the vein of you know that type of uh critique so he's he's trying to pin matt on matt's own criteria which is great and that this is probably where matt's going to fold and get mad and you already see uh matt's a little uncomfortable there in his gamer chair where he's like how is this relevant well it's relevant because it's the very thing that you're doing dude uh, it's the most relevant thing <laughs> what, what is the evidence for that claim if resurrections were known and we would have signed no matt he didn't ask you the evidence for the claim of resurrections he asked you about how you go about investigating on your view of empiricism claims of resurrections and how you disprove them journals on them people would be getting nobel prizes for demonstrating resurrections people would be coming on the news to say hey here's a resurrection which is what happened with the youtube video that was purportedly a resurrection i'm not a resurrection investigator but of the ones craig keener investigated but matt you were making claims about the status of resurrections so if you're not a resurrection investigator as an empiricist how do you know because as an empiricist, you're going to be bound to empirical sentence data. And to deny resurrections requires that you know and investigate and disprove these cases on empiricist grounds. How many resurrections did he confirm actually happened? Well, he's providing the evidence there for other people to look at. So I'm just curious, you know, you don't, you well, say it doesn't happen, but there are claims out there even today but they're not investigated. So let me, so Wait, I think Do you believe those claims, Trent? Do you believe you, those you claims can, that there are? You can ask me in your cross-examination, Matt, that's okay. fine. Okay. Uh, 
okay, here's the next one. You say that we don't have sufficient evidence for the resurrection. So that's why it's unreasonable to believe that. Um, right. what, would, what would sufficient evidence for Jesus' resurrection look like? I, I listed. This is a good question because this is getting to the question of Matt's criteria of evidence, which Trent did bring up at the beginning. And so this is a good question. The thing, it would be nice to be able to show that we have good reason to think that, that a person existed, that they died, and that they rose afterwards. Something other than just a story and claims. So he asked them for what would count, and Matt said, evidence. Well, Trent's asking, in your view, what would count as good evidence? And Matt's saying, good evidence. That is there physical okay, well, evidence for this? Uh, okay. okay. So uh, what is the physical evidence for an event in the past, Matt, that you would accept? I mean, Matt's just kind of moving the question back like every time. Like, well, uh, uh, I'll believe it on good evidence. What's good evidence? Well, uh, physical evidence. Okay, what's physical evidence that's good of something in the past, Matt? Uh, is it re fine then? Is it reasonable to believe that Jesus was crucified uh, under Pontius Pilate? I don't know where Trent's going with that, but I would have continued pressing Matt on what he's not answering already. I don't think so. Okay, so do you think that all historians in the world uh, that teach at major universities, it's unreasonable for them that they believe Jesus was crucified under? This is a, a good point. This is where Matt's going to slip up because this is something that Trent raised at the very beginning, which is that the fact that you don't think that it's reasonable doesn't count as a, a defeater for someone else believing something, right? Because Matt believes that, you know, other people can uh, believe things that he disagrees with for good reasons, right? So Trent's going to ask him, this is the part I think that Lewis clipped out, uh, Trent's going to ask him that, you know, do you believe that all of the scholars in all the universities who do believe in the death of Christ, that they all believe something unreasonable because you disagree with it? Pilot. For them to believe it, perhaps. Yeah. Um, perhaps it's unreasonable for them to believe it. For them to teach it as this is what is believed is not problematic. No, I'm saying that, so you're saying it's unreasonable to affirm that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. This is I'm what saying I history. am not convinced, I am not personally convinced that that's the case, but that's not what we're, I'm we're not, talking about. Today. I'm not interested in what you're convinced by. I'm Exactly. Bingo, right? So Trent nailed him right there, that that is the very thing Bonson hits on in the Bonson to Bosch debate, right? We're not interested in your um, reporting of psychological states. That's a psychological report. We are interested in the argument, Matt, and what's the argument for or against these criteria of evidence? What's the argument for or against believing that it's irrational to think Jesus rose from the dead? So this is the, this is the spot. This is exactly where Lewis clipped it. This is where Trent really nails Matt, and Matt just falls apart here. Because you, you agree there's a difference between what would convince you and what is reasonable to believe. Are there any no. things out there? Are there oh, well, let me ask you a question. Are there any things? Uh, yes, that was actually admitted at the beginning. So Matt just contradicted himself. Uh, you don't believe, but you think it's reasonable for other people to believe. Yeah, them. exactly. Other people at different times, yes, as, as I already alluded to. But no, I, I, of course I think I'm reasonable. Okay, so no, I'm, I'm not saying you're not reasonable. I'm saying there are other... Sorry, we might be running out of... That was to yeah. keep me on track. Did you want to finish that question, have Matt respond, and then I'll let him go? go no, ahead. like I gave an example in my opening statement. Like, at least from what I saw with your engagement with Alex O'Connor, you do not oh believe a person... What's wrong? What the hell does Alex O'Connor have to do with this? You've mentioned him twice. He's an atheist. What? It, well, the discussion uh, wasn't I, about uh matt uh why are you getting mad bro uh it perfectly relates to the question because it's an example of a situation where you disagreed with cosmic skeptics veganism but you don't think that it's unreasonable for him to have the position so matt realizes he's caught 
And that's why he says that. Okay. The, what I'm trying to find is that there is a belief you're not convinced of, but you wouldn't say is unreasonable. Do you think exactly. ethical veganism that Alex endorses yes. is unreasonable? Right. Yes. And I was okay. getting ready to get that to that in my response. <laughs> okay. okay. Why don't All we... right. So, so you, but yeah, all I wondered was, because there are things I reasonably disagree with others. I don't know if you do, but it's, it's your turn. All right, Matt, I'll give So, I mean, does everybody see the stupid thing that Matt just did there? <laughs> I mean, that's a huge problem, what he just did. Uh, Matt, I'll give you nine minutes. Start whenever. And this is, uh, yeah, no th this means that basically Trent won this debate precisely because Matt's whole argument hinges on this reporting of psychological states being an argument. And if that's not an argument, then Matt hasn't really provided any example, justification, or criteria for why he doesn't accept the testimonies of people about resurrections. Now, maybe the resurrection testimonies are false, but the point is that Matt's got to give an account for evidences, proofs, and reasons on his worldview that can't rely on descriptors of what Matt finds unconvincing, right? Which is reporting his own psychological state. Reporting your own psychological state is not an argument for why it's unreasonable to believe in a resurrection. Uh, so, yeah, it's the first time I've had an advertisement in mid-debate, especially one for a debating a dating site. And since I'm neither Catholic nor single, I'll just skip it. But that was kind of cool. Um, but nobody asked you about the ad, so we, you'll skip it. I mean, it, it, it certainly wasn't an offer. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? So I wanted to thank Trent from the start because he said something that was incredibly true and that other people frequently get wrong. In He's like, I'm on a channel where they're advertising stuff. I'll skip it. It it didn't relate to you, dude. What are you talking about? <laughs> Opening, which is, <laughs> I my position is is not to show that it's not re or that it's not reasonable to believe it that it did happen, and not to show that it's reasonable to believe that it did not happen. I don't have to be convinced that it didn't happen. I just am unconvinced that it did. And so on the issue of, of Alex... So Matt doesn't understand the difference between reporting psychological states and making arguments. I mean, that's really what we conclude from this. Whether or not uh, his ethical veganism is reasonable, no, I don't think it's reasonable. Of the claims that Craig Keener, since you referenced him, uh, found about resurrections, how many of them was he able to confirm actually occurred? Well, I don't, I don't know because uh, I haven't spoke with him about how many he believes happened. I think okay. some are related. How to many? Him. How many do you believe happened? Um, I don't know. Uh, I've heard a claim. Uh, well, there's one by a guy named Simon Kimbangu uh, in 19th century in Africa who had a reputation for raising people from the dead that Robert Price cited as an example of having evidence um, similar or less than to Jesus. And that's a possibility, but I'll be frank, I haven't, I haven't investigated them thoroughly uh, because I'm not setting out to debunk them. They could have happened, they couldn't have happened. It doesn't really change my major views on things. Now, wait a minute. Um, now, I, I, I agree in principle with Trent's point there, but what Trent just conceded there kind of concedes the whole point of this debate. If it doesn't really matter that these people were resurrected, then doesn't that presuppose that Jesus's resurrection is something unique and different? So if Jesus's resurrection is something unique and different, it's unique and different than these other resurrections that Trent doesn't really care about confirming or de denying because the system of Christianity is true. So it's not actually a debate or an argument about the fact of the resurrection. It's actually an argument about the systems themselves. Atheism as a worldview, Christianity as a whole worldview and paradigm. So I haven't really set out to say they don't happen, but I'm open to them having happened. It's quite possible. Okay. <laughs> if I was Matt, so I would have I would have in on that. Are at least likely happening now. Or, or that resurrection, sorry. So you notice that Matt wasn't sophisticated enough at all to basically do anything. I mean, Matt hasn't given any argument other than to state his own status of unbelief. Okay. Yeah, we know, Matt. Like, you're here as an atheist. 
we know you don't find all this stuff convincing or else you wouldn't be an atheist. So where's the argument? Still waiting. Um, but again, Matt doesn't know the difference between reporting psychological states and arguments. Which are stories. Um, it's, um, it's possible, but I, I think that it would be very infrequent. How do you know it's possible? I, how, how do you know it's possible? Because, G, because Jesus rose from the dead. And... Now, Matt is not intentionally swift enough to see that he's actually hit on a good point. Um, but the point you can, you guys can see the point I would make here, right? So the only reason Trent believes that resurrections are possible is because he believes in the resurrection of Christ. In other words, because he's a Christian. So the Christian paradigm determines Trent's belief system in terms of what is and isn't possible. But if Trent understood that, then he would be a presuppositionalist and he would admit what we think. He wouldn't be doing this type of argumentation and, you know, just sort of assuming that things aren't theory laden and, and whatnot, because the very things he's saying basically admit that beliefs and belief systems are part of a web and that they're, that the, the, pro, the individual beliefs and words and meanings are theory laden. And if they're theory laden, then it's a comparison of worldviews. Oh, no, that, that means... you, that's the thing we're debating. You don't get to assume right. that. How do you, if your, well, if I, your belief, I you. if, hang on, if your belief that, that resurrections are happening now is based on the fact that you think. Jesus... Now I'll actually get Matt a point here. Uh, this is actually a good point, right? Because Trent is presupposing that resurrections are possible and they're possible because of the supposed stack of evidence that makes it plausible or possible that Jesus resurrected. But the meaning of resurrection isn't independent of the rest of Christianity. So if Matt's swift enough, he should call him out and say, well, the resurrection only has the meaning that you think it has in the Christian paradigm. There's no brute factuality about resurrections like having some significance outside of the Christian paradigm. This is resurrected. That doesn't mean that it, your belief is reasonable. That just is a cascading unreasonableness. Well, no, because I gave an argument for why it's reasonable to believe Jesus rose from the dead based on the evidence provided. And so if he rose from the dead and he's divine, uh, he could have power to work miracles today or throughout history. So, so, so you're basically true. saying that you're willing to accept a, a claim of a resurrection as reasonable without any physical evidence. Well, what, what kind of physical evidence would a resurrection have, especially one in the past? We would just be trying, when it comes to a claim All of resurrections resurrection, are in the past. Everything is in the past. Right. Yeah. I'm asking you, uh, well, are, are you willing to accept a claim of resurrection as reasonable in the absence of any physical evidence? What you Here's where Matt's messing up because Matt doesn't understand that all Trent has to do is keep turning the question back on him about the criteria of proof and evidences, right? That's what Trent already did, and I'm sure he's going to continue to do it because Matt is missing the whole point. I mean by physical evidence? Well, do we have... You know, I mean, the criteria that Matt is going to demand for physical evidence of things in the past is literally going to undercut the possibility of all history. That's so dumb. And Matt can't grasp this. Uh, doctor's reports on the cause of illness and death and then a period of time where they were confirmed to be dead and then a period of time where they were confirmed to be living again after that. And this is so low IQ. Like, so uh, we should doubt all people's deaths until we have doctor's reports that confirm the time of death and a period in which they can be watched to see for sure that they're dead. I mean, on Matt's grounds, we don't have any good reason to believe in anyone's death without that. <laughs> <laughs> this is so silly. With medical examinations, and how do you know you're not <laughs> okay, just being okay. conned? Okay, so you're saying to be reasonable. I think I see you're tracking here. For it to be reasonable to believe in resurrection, you'd have to affirm a person did exist and they died, and they were seen alive after their death. Um, in some well, you cases, to past prove the that important death happened, points there. I, I'm, I, was speci I was specifically asking about with a lack of physical evidence, and the physical evidence that I would be talking about is medical scientific evidence about that individual. It's not that, you know, well, it may be the be case. That wouldn't be physical evidence. That would be another kind of testimonial evidence from someone like a doctor who says, yep, this person is dead because I'm very familiar with 
what you know what constitutes yeah matt doesn't really have a coherent account of what would actually constitute physical evidence and he doesn't understand that again that's all going to be like based on presuppositions right and assumptions that this is a reliable piece of physical evidence that a doctor really wrote this right and he just admitted that you could be conned well yeah but so could you so your own criteria of what counts as physical evidence can't give an account for physical evidence right it's it's begging the question and it would undercut its own self it's a dead person uh now modern medicine is fairly new so in older resurrection accounts like the one we're currently debating uh we would have to rely on other kinds of testimony and i think it's very likely well basically what happened is that jesus did die from crucifixion based on all the details and all the accounts related there so so you're willing to accept the a, a, that an individual rose from the dead with no nothing more than just testimonial evidence. It's amazing to me that this debate is progressing like this without actually just getting into epistemology. I mean, that's what's at root here. Um, maybe Trent thinks that if he went into that route, Matt would like, you know, skip out because he would be like, I'm not here to debate epistemology. I'm here to debate the resurrection, you know. Maybe that's why he doesn't kind of push on that domain, or maybe he will later, I don't know. But, I mean, it should be evident by now that, like, isn't it obvious that these two people have totally different criteria of truth and evidence? And that that's a prior question to <laughs> arguing about the resurrection itself. Because Matt doesn't have, he seems, I mean, at least Trent has some ideas of what would count as evidence and that kind of a coherent presentation of, how we would go about that and what that would entail. Matt doesn't even seem to have any clear idea about distinguishing evidence, what counts as evidence, the criteria of evidence, and his own psychological descriptive state of unbelief. Like he, he doesn't know the difference. Well, how do we know that anything happened in the past? I don't, I don't know why testimony. you won't answer the question. I, I'm asking- He's asking you, He's answering your question on the basis of what you're saying. If what you're saying is true, Matt, then really we wouldn't know anything about the past. And so Matt doesn't actually adhere to the empiricism that he claims to adhere to. He's not really a skeptic. He's a skeptic when he wants to be a skeptic and then a dogmatist when he wants to be, uh, you know, making an argument or trying to refute people or trying to argue for evidences. Are you I, you're saying willing. you're willing? Are you saying you're willing to believe a resurrection with nothing more than testimonial evidence? I am willing to believe that Jesus Christ died by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. For that is the not same the question reason. I asked. Why is it every time I, I, I ask a well, question Matt, you I, go back I, to something I, that's I, not the answer? answer the is it my time to ask questions or not? I thought this sure. whole thing you can ask was to be able to interrupt to read your. I, I'm sure. willing to let you answer if you will answer the question. Objection, Your Honor. Non-responsive. Are you saying going to, you are? Are you I'm saying? Answer, I'm just not going to give you. Are you going to keep trying to talk over me while I'm asking the question again? <laughs> Go ahead. Are you saying that you are willing to believe that a resurrection occurred, based only on testimonial evidence? Will you allow me to answer the question sufficiently? I promise I can do it in less than thirty seconds. It's a yes or no question, Trent. Well, it may not be, Matt, because you might be setting up a false either or. So you don't, you can't force a person to answer in an either or or a yes or no if it's a loaded question, right? So Matt is acting like there's no such thing as loaded questions. Um, and, and Matt's getting nervous because he's, he's losing, all right? And the same, the, this exact same thing happened in the debate with me where when Matt wasn't able to either understand or reply to the arguments I was giving, he starts getting like this, right? And this is a way to filibuster and deflect and get away from the, the actual meat of the matter, right? So there's multiple reasons why people do this in debate, but I think that if you look at the body language and look at Matt's kind of shifting around and moving around in his gamer chair, um, you can tell he's getting mad because it's not that Trent isn't answering his question. It's that Matt doesn't like the answer that he's getting and it's causing him to be a little, you know, he's, he's getting a little nervous. Yes, I believe Thank that you. people can testify to things that happen That's in the world. That's not what I asked. I said, are you well, willing to- If you to want to be want, interesting, what? fine, yes, 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 fine. Okay. If you only want to answer no, then yes. It's not interesting, I, I but have, okay. 
I wouldn't have conceded that. I would have said you just because you're the interlocutor, you don't get to ask loaded questions, right? So that's the way I would have responded to that. I'm not saying that he's necessarily making a bad move in conceding that to Matt. Uh, we'll have to see where it goes. I, I'm not. I'm not here for interesting. I'm here to find out what's reasonable. And here, here's the crux of it, which we can have this discussion. Well, after. Matt, actually, he asked you multiple times what counts as reasonable and what counts as proof and evidence. And your attempt to explain that was garbage, gibberish. It's because I don't, I don't have any follow-up questions after this. And, and that is this. You are willing to accept that an extraordinary, miraculous event occurred based only on testimony, and I am not. That's it. That is the foundational difference between our epistemology. I will. Well, the problem with this is now, now you, Matt's using big words, which he doesn't know epistemology. Uh, <laughs> I mean, again, if Jesus re was raised from the dead, then it's not extraordinary that people rise from the dead, right? So Matt keeps just saying that it's extraordinary, it's extraordinary, extraordinary, which Matt hasn't shown that it's actually extraordinary because it's only extraordinary if Christianity isn't true or Matt's view is correct, right? Matt's skepticism and atheism is the case. Then it is, but I mean, that's what's in debate here. So both sides kind of keep um, making arguments as if their positions are true. So we've seen this from Trent and we've seen it from Matt, but Matt is really kind of uh, unraveling here. Not accept that the physical understanding of the universe was suspended for an individual based only on testimonial accounts. It is unreasonable. Matt, you don't have an account for the physical understanding of the universe. And uh, I drilled this home in our debate about 10 times in a row where I kept asking you for uh, an account for the principle of induction, which underlies science and your supposed naturalistic understanding of the universe, right? So you think that there's a scientific materialist account for the universe which rests upon the principle of induction i said can you please give an account for the principle of induction you didn't know what that was or how to do that and you said there is no account for it so actually matt it's you that is the dogmatist and the arbitrary person here well that is how you get conned that is a, how do magicians do you no i didn't but it's my time isn't it if you want to pontificate go ahead i did and now i'm done why is he acting like this? I mean, th this guy like can't debate, right? Like he, when he does this, he shows that it's, and it's not because you can't get heated in a debate. It's not like if you get heated, oh, you're losing. Cause you get, no debates get heated. They get, you know, they're passionate. They, you know, that that's part of debate. Right. And so there's nothing like, it's toxic masculinity if you get hit. I mean, what did Matt Frad say? You can interrupt, you can get heated, you can, you know, be rude. But really, Matt? Again, I thought I thought that I was toxic for being that way in a couple debates. And here you are saying you can do that. Um, they're getting heated. By the way, where's Matt, like, getting hurt and telling other Matt to leave, right? Shouldn't Matt Frad be telling Matt D to leave because he's being toxic here? I mean, I don't know if, if Matt thinks that that was some kind of own, like he's he's popping, uh, you know, like uh, raisinets or like milk duds in his mouth. Like he that was some big self own there. You should have, let me, let me show you this because this is what he did was funny. He's like popping milk duds in his mouth after that kind of heated <laughs> little uh, bant there. Look at this, watch this. Except that an extraordinary, miraculous event occurred based only on testimony, and I am not. That's it. That is the foundational difference between our epistemology. I will not accept that the physical understanding of the universe was suspended for an individual based only on testimonial accounts. It is unreasonable. That is how you get conned. That is how magicians fool you. No, I didn't, but it's my time, isn't it? Yeah, Matt. It's your time to do cross-examination, Goober. Does he not know? I mean, this guy doesn't even know what he's doing in the debate to the extent of what you do in debate, right? Like you do opening statements and then you cross-examine. And Matt, Matt's just ranting. 
about you want to pontificate go ahead yeah i did and now i'm done <laughs> watch him pop a milk dud in his mouth here <laughs> it's like i mean dude like did you think that was some kind of own by ranting pontificating so you, you just wasted your cross-examination with with that uh yeah good job dude really good job Okay. Well, now I'm looking forward to this part, and I think we'll we'll get the super chats right out of this because the next part, uh, Trent's gonna cross examine Matt, and he, wow, right? Like, um, I'm uh, it was already kind of heated, so I'm gonna bet that uh, Matt's gonna get pretty uncomfortable now. But Trent might uh, back off and not want to get him too agitated. I would I would go full in. I'd be like just drill into that dude and and pin him. Matt, how would you like to proceed? All right, let me. What it's are just I discussion just, time? I, but I was I just trying to is. get the. Wait, just discussion time. So, two, so opening statements and then cross examinations and nothing else. Uh, I thought you were doing a formal debate. Now it's discussion time. Come on, dude. This would have been perfect for Trent to just nail him. Yeah, we'll we'll move into twenty minutes of discussion. I want to kind of maybe kick it off by asking oh each of you a question. Would that be okay, um, Trent? Do you think that uniformity of the laws of nature provide evidence against miracles? Uh, I think, well, actually, no. The uniformity of the laws of nature are necessary for, for something to be a miracle. In my opening statement, I gave the example of a life jacket. Like, you notice an orange life jacket because the water around it is totally... Uh, this is, you know, really... Uh... It really would have been so much better if they had done another like rebuttal or cross examination. Oh, because I mean, he could have just like bodied Matt, right? Like he could, he could have just like demolished this this goober. And I mean, Matt is like you know, kind of the king of self owns. So I don't guess it's absolutely necessary, but it looks like, um, in the description of the show, they go for open discussion, which I'm going to skip past a lot of this. And I'm just going to go to the, to the closing statement. So let's see if Trent kind of nails him in that. Uh, we'll, we'll listen to the question that's asked to Matt, but then we may have to skip. different. So if you didn't have uniform laws of nature, we wouldn't have any way. The word miracle actually comes from a Greek word that means sign. So if God were to make a sign of his uh, intervention in the world, it have to be different from the natural world around us. Otherwise, we just say, "Oh, well, that's like how everything goes." We we wouldn't we wouldn't notice it. So, I don't think that it's evidence against it. I think rather that we have to think. Okay, well, I agree with Matt. We should try to figure out how the world is. But the world is a strange place, and so uh, there are things that upset the apple cart a bit. And this may be one of them. And so I say is this an exception to a general rule we have just like we have discovered other exceptions for example for 1500 and i promise to be done for, for 1500 years in europe people thought swans were always white that was their uniform experience but then there was testimony in 1697 that black swans had been found in australia but it wasn't like oh we can't possibly believe that it's like oh we might need a little bit more but if it's sincere reliable testimony that actually shows the world's very different from what we know and i think the same can be done for the resurrection Matt, why don't you respond to that question? Then I'll ask you a question and I have Trent respond and then you guys can get into it. Oh, is, this, well, actually, is this how you want to do it? Well, this is. The, I just want to ask each of you one question and give you time, both time to respond and then I'll let the two of you go at it. So I just wanted to give Matt oh. a chance to respond to, to you there. So, yeah, I, actually, I'm in agreement with Trent. I, the, the law, and in order for something to be considered a miracle, it must violate the laws of nature. There needs to be um, order. So... Uh, Matt, what, on what basis do you believe that there are laws of nature as a supposed skeptic who is now citing David Hume? I mean, uh, David Hume points out that you can't justify belief in the laws of nature because you don't have a justification for induction. Um, and you're trying to cite David Hume, and now you're, what, not following David Hume? I mean, again, if you're going to say that there are these things, you're going to have to give an account for them because on Matt's own standard of, of, of justification, his own standard of what's rational to believe, it's 
only believe things that you have sufficient, strong empirical evidence for. But what is the empirical evidence for a law of nature, a universal state of affairs, Matt, as an empiricist? Oh, you don't have a basis to believe that. And if you read David Hume, you would know that. Or to recognize the thing that's different. That's not controversial at all. I think it's okay. absolutely hilarious, though, uh, at all the people in chat who are claiming that I'm angry and rude when during my questioning time, I'm just trying to get a question across. Uh, ooh, Matt's butt hurt that the audience is laughing at his uh, emotional outburst where he's obviously butt hurt. I mean, yeah, Matt, uh, you are losing. And I would say you pretty much already lost if Trent can really kind of drill into um, the nonsense that, you, that you've been saying for the last hour. Funny. No, it's in my message everyone in the chat. That's, that, that's just how it goes. Actually, I mean, yeah. I could drive to, I it's wish I could internet. drive to, I, I wish I could drive to Austin. I'm only three hours away from you. We could grab a beer or whatnot. It's it's just, folks, it's once just the, hard Once the quarantine's over, do it. <laughs> I when, will. Once, I will. Once this quarantine's over, I, I'm up for my second inoculation in like two weeks, I think. What is this? Like, what's this? The this, this sacrament of the stabbies here. This is ridiculous. They're like, uh, I mean, what's in these pints that Frad is serving up? Is it like pints of pure soy? I mean, if you look at the rotund appearance of Aquinas, I'm, I probably is, right? I mean, like, uh, you know, I, I think I'll pass on the, 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 the soy pints with, uh, with, uh, Frad and, and, uh, Dillahunty there. Um, hell, we, we I, can I sit down in the studio and record. All right. Here's a, an appointment. But well, I'm older, yeah. so I'm older and diabetic. So I got my appointment. <laughs> All right, here's a question for Matt. I'll let you... Cringe is right, dude. What the, what, is the, what are they even talking about? Like, let's go get... A, oh, I can't have diabetes. I, like, Dude, a Wilford Brimley Baker's boomer level stuff, time to respond, dude. And then Trent, you can respond to him, and then I'll let the two of you uh, feel free to have a conversation. What, how does Matt have an audience? I li literally don't... like. There, there just means a giant horde of like just the most low IQ internet people. Like, How does this guy still have followers after like dozens of self owns that are meme material that should be viral i mean I, I just don't get it matt can testimonial evidence alone make a belief reasonable on its own no but the testimonial evidence is always viewed within the pool of things we already understand if you say i got a new puppy last night I, that is reasonable for me to accept because I know that puppies exist and people get them for pets and there's nothing extraordinary. The, everything about the, your claim is consistent with what I already know and understand to be true about reality. Okay, so Matt, like, dude, do you understand how many times you've contradicted yourself? Because you just asked if testimonial evidence was enough to believe in a claim of Trent about five minutes ago. And when Trent said yes, you laughed. So Matt Fry just asked you basically the same type of question. And you said, yes, because if somebody says they got a puppy, it's reasonable to believe that. So you do believe that it's reasonable to believe in testimonial evidence alone. But you laughed at Trent for saying that it's reasonable to believe in testimonial evidence alone. Dude, Matt, you're a joke. By experience and evidence. So it's not, you, you, you could view that as, oh, I'm, your testimony an, alone is enough. But that's a colloquial thing. That, that is us saying, I will take you at your word. But the truth is, when I say that, I'm saying, I will take you at your word considering all the mountains of evidence I have about how the universe already works. Yeah, but that's begging the question because the debate is about resurrections and whether they're reasonable. And you're basically saying that uh, I will only accept resurrections if they're reasonable. And then when you say what's reasonable is testimonial evidence and you say testimonial evidence plus physical evidence, but there's no physical evidence of things in the past. So it is reasonable for testimonial evidence only in my criteria of what counts as evidence, which is physical evidence. But Matt, you're just you're just you just admitted that <laughs> the very thing that you called out Trent for is something that you can accept for you, 
when it fits your presuppositions of what's ra- rational and reasonable. So it's a, it's a circle here, right? So Matt believes that uh, resurrections can only be known or proven through the very things that undercut the possibility of anything from history being true. Matt doesn't understand that his criteria are undercutting the possibility of Matt knowing anything about history. Trent. Okay. Uh, yeah. What I would say is that in the vast majority of cases, testimony uh, is sufficient. Uh, Matt's got a giant Pizza Hut glass. Like, like he's got a Pizza Hut glass that he would. Did he take that from Pizza Hut? Like, full of like Mountain Dew or like what, what's what is full? What is? Uh, I bet Matt is a, a Dr Pepper kind of guy, right? I mean, he's got a giant pizza hut glass full of doctor but in some cases we we might need a little bit more uh so i think for example with the resurrection i think we have very good testimony um uh so we have uh we have testimony going back to saint paul uh who was an eyewitness of the original disciples so we have good evidence to believe and even atheistic scholars as i cited like paula fredrickson and richard carrier and on this would say that the original disciples claimed Jesus rose from the dead, and this was motivated by a genuine experience that they sincerely thought this had happened. So yeah, I, I agree, like the, the, a testimonial is something, one person's testimony for the mundane, for something that's extra mundane, I might need more testimony. If it's a group of people, and they're willing to suffer costly punishment for affirming. Yeah, this is where all of this evidentialist resurrection stuff is terrible. Like it just falls apart, like, I mean, it's not it's a non sequitur from the fact that the apostles went from being scared to being willing to die that the system of christianity is true right because it it's own that's only a good argument if christianity is true but that's what's in question i mean aren't there countless people who die for false religions so the fact that a person is willing to die for the for the position has nothing to do with the truth or falsity ultimately so uh this is just piss poor just terrible classical evidentialist arguments that, that always fail and will never convince the atheists because they're not challenging his presuppositions. This belief, uh, then that starts to raise uh, the likelihood the belief is true. Most things we believe about, every, nearly everything we believe about <coughs> in the world, for example, is based on testimony. Like Yeah, I saw- this is a great point, right? I mean, Matt believes all kinds of things merely on the, the basis of testimony. And I even had one of my friends a long time ago, he called into uh matt's show back when he did the local austin show and asked matt on what basis he believes in um all of the scientific research that he claims to believe in in other words matt did you go verify the papers independently and all the scientists that write those papers well of course matt no i haven't done that oh so you believe on testimony of what's reported about science papers and scientific peer reviewed research studies that those are true, but you haven't investigated any of those studies empirically on your own. And Matt was like, no. And then he hung up on the guy because Matt doesn't want to go in the areas where he's trapped. I did in my, in my um, opening statement, if you went on Matt's conclusion, I mean, he even said it was not reasonable to believe Jesus was crucified. You're going to abandon ancient history and, and scholarship. Yes, this is a great point. That was what I was just saying. Everything Matt's saying, Matt doesn't even realize is going to undercut all of historical research. It's not reasonable. So or, now all historical claims are unreasonable on Matt's system. I'll let, I'll let the t- I, I said I wasn't convinced it was reasonable. I didn't say it was not reasonable. Yeah, it doesn't matter, Matt, that you're not convinced because that's a reporting of psychological states and that's irrelevant to a debate and not an argument all right uh, we have 18 minutes I'll... trent should have pressed him again on that because matt just again made a, a a serious no-no you guys have a conversation and then we'll take we'll have 30 minutes of q a after right. that so if you're in the live stream right now just if this doesn't go anywhere if, tr- if trent time. doesn't boil down drill down and just kind of d- just end the, the whole matt thing then we're going to move on to the super chats all right guys go well, uh, how do we do this without? I enjoy well, talking with you, Matt. You're fun. I, I, I uh, do too. We... And and that's, I, gosh, I wish people could understand that more. That just because you, you know there might be a minute of raw doesn't mean that we're you know. So, 
you talked about all Matt cares about is how he's perceived by the audience who were all just uh, kind of mocking him and making fun of him. <laughs> so he's like, it's funny that he's all butthurt and bothered by this. Uh, and he's trying to like dial it back and dial it down because he, he realizes he looks ridiculous. Having more testimony. And I'm on record as saying the plural of anecdote isn't data. So it doesn't matter how many testimonials you have, that alone is not going to be uh, enough and, unless you view that in the broader stream of things. And the way I've explained uh, wait a minute, Matt. So now it doesn't matter how many people attest to something. You said at the very beginning of your whole thing that it's reasonable to believe whatever most people believe. <laughs> I mean, how do people follow this guy? Like, this is like, what? In this is that like my mom. Okay, this dude is like a walking like meme, like just spits out like from minute to minute. It's just like another contradiction. I, I, I don't like doing this, but my mom is a fundamentalist Southern Baptist Christian who believes. She oh, well, if we're going to get in the domain of uh, like psychological motivations, which, you know, Matt seems to like to play psychoanalyst and figure out the motivations existentially, why people believe things. Maybe now we're beginning to see that Matt's still an edgy 17 year old rebelling against his mom has seen demons okay now i'm happy to believe that my mom thinks that she has seen something but that doesn't mean uh, that i'm i'm justified in accepting that what she's actually that she's correct about what she's seen same with people who are abducted by aliens um or, or claim no, sorry well, people who claim well, they're abducted by aliens. well so it sounds like your epistemology because if you notice my opening here we go finally yes trent go into his epistemology which is garbage it's nonsense Oops. I hit the pause button. Statement. I didn't use like natural. Quick question. Would you sit through a free 12 minute video if I promise to share how I've helped the hundreds stupid ad of come up. Hold on, let me get transform their mediocre lives as a result of So the screen is frozen. So hold on a second. I think that the belief is reasonable. For example, Matt Matt is not convinced of Alex O'Connor's ethical veganism. But I doubt Matt would say Alex is unreasonable for being an ethical vegan. Likewise, Matt's personal doubts about the resurrection are irrelevant to whether belief in the resurrection is reasonable. Right. Instead, Matt has to defend an objective standard for what makes beliefs reasonable yes. or unreasonable. So let me offer three tests to see. All right, that restarted. That the is so hold on. For example, Matt Matt is not convinced of Alex O'Connor's ethical veganism, but I doubt Matt would say. Alex All right. We're going to have to go to the uh, Super Chats because my computer froze up there. I might be able to pull it back up. We were just getting to the good point. I, I want to see if uh, Trent I think that the belief is reasonable. goes after him. For example, Matt, D Matt is not so convinced we of Alex O'Connor. Here we go, 58. That's a wide spectrum to go from, hey, it's unusual for somebody to win the lottery, even though it happens all the time. Well about what she's seen so give me just one second i'm going to pull it back up because the window kind of collapsed there same with people who are abducted by right, can you guys hear that is that coming um, through right or claim no sorry well, people who claim well, they're abducted by aliens. well so it sounds like your epistemology because if you notice my opening statement, I didn't use like natural, supernatural. I used that, usual, or... unusual. Because like alien abduction, that's a natural occurrence. Well, what's you the difference think? between, like there are plenty of things that are unusual in my life, but hmm. um, usual and unusual. Unusual is like, that's a wide spectrum to go from, hey, it's unusual for somebody to win the lottery, even though it happens all the time, Well, to well, what, somebody what was raised from the dead. I guess like what do alien abductions resurrection claims it, it seems like what they have in common is uh they're disputed uh and they don't happen very often uh that, that seems to be like 
just basically what they have in common. So like, what would we use to determine, like, like wh when would it be reasonable for someone to think they had an encounter with an extraterrestrial being, I guess? I don't, I don't know what it would take. Um, see, here's the thing. We're, we're talking about two different things. I don't know what- What would it take for, like, like, if I had an experience that I was convinced was being abducted by aliens, um, mm -hmm. that is independent from what it would take for you to believe that I actually was abducted by aliens. Uh, what? Okay, well, I mean, what if you, um, you told me you had been abducted by aliens and you called me and like I talked to you at nine o'clock at night and you're in Texas and then you call me at 3 a.m. and you say I was abducted by aliens and they dropped me off in Tokyo and like- Well, hang on. An airline ticket you're, and you, you just invented something that has potential physical evidence that's completely different. You, okay. you added something to the story. Well, I'd be adding more testimony. Like there'd be people who would say like, I saw Matt, your Japanese fans be like, I saw Matt Dillahunty in, in Tokyo. And uh, you know- it's, it's, but it's, well, it's not just, oh, I saw Matt in Tokyo. We could prove that I was in Tokyo. Okay. So this whole debate is over the nature of evidence and proofs um, ultimately. So that's where they're just kind of going in circles and that I, I hope <clears throat> if Trent doesn't really get to a point here, we're going to have to, to call it a night because <clears throat> it's already two. I'm having a lot of fun. I mean, I'm still ready to go. I'm still energized and I will be energized, ready to go tomorrow, <clears throat> Lord willing, but <clears throat> I'm going to have to get some sleep and uh, I don't think Matt's going to recover from this very well. So if that, but if that, okay, let's just say we have the physical evidence there. Um, would you then be allowed to go through this reasoning process? Um, I can't provide an explanation for how I got to Tokyo, so it must be an extraterrestrial explanation. No, 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 that's a fallacy. Well, then how would you, would, oh, would that wait, circumstance with the physical evidence convince you you'd been abducted? No. It wouldn't. No, if my position is I don't have an explanation for how this happened, I don't get to invent one and I don't get to claim it's aliens or angels or gods or demons or anything. If I don't have an explanation, then I don't have an explanation. And as much as that sucks, that's the truth. So even if like there was like Independence Day spaceships over the earth, would that, I, I mean, I, I'm picking aliens because I'm just saying this isn't a natural supernatural question. I'm trying to figure out, like you say, we don't have sufficient evidence for the resurrection, but if you can't tell me what the sufficient evidence is, like what would be sufficient evidence? Like if, I, I guess here, I'll ask this question and you can rip it apart if you want. Okay. Is your position that you have no idea what sufficient evidence for the resurrection looks like, but you're confident you haven't seen such evidence? Correct. In the same way that w this is asked to me quite often about, you know, what would change your mind about God? And mm -hmm. my, answer, my answer is, I don't know what would change my mind because it would be arrogant of me to presume that I have the understanding of reality to be able to tell the difference between a real God and a fake God or. This is the feigned humility that they, they always try to appeal to, like that their position is the, you know, measured, you know, skeptical one. And, well, I'm not arrogant, so I'm not gonna try to claim, but Matt doesn't understand that the dogmatism that he propounds actually assumes and makes all kinds of metaphysical dogmatic claims and basically, ways it basically slants the evidence such that there is no evidence that matt would accept is what this amounts to and so trent's inadvertently i think getting to the point of presuppositionalism which is that the problem of the atheist is not a lack of evidence it's a bad will and that's what romans one says men aren't lacking in facts and evidence in fact they misinterpret the facts and evidence willfully according to romans one some being this just powerful enough or a strong delusion or an evil demon or whatever else. Sure. But if there is a God, that God absolutely knows what, what would convince me and has not provided that evidence yet. Okay. But then here's my follow-up question. If you don't know what the sufficient evidence looks like, you have no idea what it looks like. How can you be convinced you haven't seen it? Because what, what if you failed to recognize it? It'd be like if I... This is actually a good point, right? Because Matt has not ever given a, con a consistent, coherent theory of evidences and proofs. And what is the sufficient evidence and proof that's necessary? And yet he keeps saying that there is no proof. That I haven't seen it. I can't find it. We don't know it. Nobody knows. 
It's, it's not possible, blah, 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 blah. And Trent just keeps asking him, okay, but that assumes that you have a criteria of proof and evidence and that you know what is and isn't sufficient. But you're saying that you can't presume to have that. So Matt is literally talking out of both sides of his mouth. Said, I have no idea what a hygrometer looks like, but I know I haven't seen one. Seems like you've left yourself open to, you've missed it because you don't know what it looks like. I, I would never say, if I don't know what a hygrometer looks like, I would never say, I know that I haven't seen one. Okay. I could, what I does, could not if, say that if, I haven't seen something I don't know. What I'm saying is that, and so in all the opportunities for somebody to present sufficient evidence, what they have presented are fall fallacies and testimony. There's no physical evidence. There's nothing that would rise to the level of being admissible in a courtroom. Uh, Matt, actually, testimonies are admissible in courtrooms, which you said you don't accept. <laughs> I mean, does Matt not know that, like, courtrooms use testimonies of witnesses? Okay. Um, well, at least in a courtroom... You, and I've heard you make this analogy before, and I think it's problematic for claims related to history, because a courtroom is not actually ordered towards a courtroom is not ordered towards finding the truth. There are biases in the courtroom to prevent the punishment of the innocent. Uh, Correct. So you know, so I mean, the, we like those we biases can't do are. Double, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Well, like like we don't do we can't try somebody twice, even if we get new evidence. Like. It's it's slated so that we'd rather let uh, an innocent, you know a guilty person go free. It's not just about finding yes. truth. It yes. seems like I, I'm just I'm wary of those kinds of analogies. I think we should say, well, what does the evidence point to but, to this in the past? And for me, go ahead. That's the foundation of my epistemology, which is what I pointed out in the opening. This is this whole notion about the bias in the courtroom to avoid punishing the innocent is exactly right. the same thing as I have a bias in my epistemology to avoid being conned. Oh, you see, Matt, exactly, thank you. So now we get Matt's epistemology, which he couches as a way to avoid being conned, but which he doesn't realize is actually his own way to wait and reject the evidence such that nothing will count to convince Matt of anything other than what he finds psychologically convincing. So Matt is basically admitting that I will determine the criteria of evidence and what counts as evidence for me and nothing else can be evidence. And so therefore, since God does not meet the standard of evidence that I demand, there is no God. There you go. Matt doesn't even realize that that's what he's done. So I think we'll end it there because, I mean, Matt really just isn't even getting the point. And um, duped into believing something that isn't true. I want to believe as many true things as possible and as few false things as possible. And you have to have both. Okay, but Matt, to talk about the true and the false uh, requires a criteria of truth making. Uh, and it, it requires an account of epistemology. And your empiricism and skepticism, by definition, can't do that. But Matt can, cannot figure that out. So uh, let's move on to the Super Chats. We've gone for uh, long enough. And remember, everybody, to uh, subscribe to Jay's Analysis to support my work and to support uh, this endeavor. And uh, you can also get 40% off in the chalk.com store of the supplements, the nootropics that are really, really good stuff. I highly recommend it. They work. Try it for yourself just to see. And let's get to these super chats. So there was one from a couple days ago that I missed. Victor Ziegler, $5. He says, I'm reading your book. I absolutely love it, dude. Which one? Part one or two? Uh, be sure and read part two if you're only reading part one. I was a bit hesitant as I'm not much into movies, but the way that you entangle basically all the aspects of the global oligarchy within the context of movies is breathtaking. My hand's off to you. God bless. Well, hey, shout out to Victor Ziegler. Uh, hey, you don't like movies, but you are named after the Eyes Wide Shut guy. <laughs> You're right, bro. <clears throat> Joy for 10 bucks. Glory to God. Thank you for your work, Jay. Well, thank you very much, Joy. Much appreciated. Green Feathers, $35. Uh, hey, awesome, bro. Much appreciated. Um, I got to watch your interview with Tristan. Uh, excuse me, beautiful Tristana. That was a great interview. 
Um, who was the dude that popped in trying to debate? That was kind of weird. I, I, I was, I thought you and Tristan were doing an interview and then this dude pops in like with, uh, the low tier relativism. And I was like, what's going on? But, uh, it was entertaining. So I will share that video. So thank you. Green feathers, ELC, shout out to ELC from the discord. A big problem problem with the arguments here is that Matt could theoretically be converted to agree with everything that Trent says and then go into perennialism. Yeah, exactly. Um, and le- if we're not arguing for the Christian paradigm, then the resurrection doesn't stand as this. It's not some vacuum. It doesn't. It wasn't an event that occurred in a vacuum. The resurrection only makes sense with the Trinity. It only makes sense with the virgin birth and the rest of the system. Jesus is just one of the manifestations of God if we can separate and divorce the doctrine of the resurrection from the rest of Christianity is what ELC's great point is, absolutely. Then made by Jim Bob, $25, what's up? He says, I've been using any argument against the existence of God that can be used against the existence of truth, revealing that no one is without faith. Please critique. Let's see. Against the existence of God would also be applicable to so any argument that an atheist says um god doesn't exist because uh there's no let's say physical evidence right maybe a mat approach could i take that and replace it with um so what you're basically saying is that there's no reason to believe in truth capital t truth in an, in an epistemic way or a logical way or an objective way uh does that work uh i like where it's going i think that it's kind of the tag approach i'd have to sit and think if you could if you could interject truth into every atheist argument if it would still hold i tend to think it might but i'd have to think about that more so but really good question jim i appreciate that Palantir $3. I, uh, if Matt claimed to be an empiricist positivist epistemology, wait, if Matt claimed an empiricist positive epistemology, which he does, and then started to undermine Trent's entire metaphysical foundation, do you think Trent would be sharp enough to grasp the objection and respond? Well, well, I guess we will find out tomorrow night, won't we? <laughs> exactly. Hacksaw Jim Duganism, $5. Glory to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen to that. Fried fly daddy two three four last week you mentioned uh father deacon dr ananias's epistemology lecture is a must watch uh it's the one that he did on orthodox shahada the one with lewis you said i looked this up and five different ones came up the one on orthodox shahada um which one are you referring to that one so shout out to fly daddy and that's the one you're looking for Palantir three dollars <clears throat> what if an atheist in the debate just outright denies justified true beliefs and sidesteps these the theist framework by claiming that he's a pragmatist in epistemology as long as it works in practice it's justified well the pragmatism actually isn't a justification because uh, kind of bound up in the notion of pragmatism is some idea of what it means for something to work, right? So in, in that, there's a kind of uh, criteria of value judgments uh, that tell you this works better, that works worse, we want to do what works better. But those are all things that don't fit with pragmatism, right? Pragmatism is an a-metaphysical position, typically. It's a deontological type of position, And yet it's relying on these types of things. And if we don't have to justify our claims, then there's no good reasons to believe in pragmatism. And pragmatism can't just say, well, we should believe in it because it works. Because it's begging the question, works to do what? Works for what? Right? Then it's going beyond pragmatism. And if you don't have to justify your claims, that's essentially saying you don't have to give good reasons for your beliefs. And if that's the case, then um, there's no debate. There's no argumentation. Well, Emmanuel, $5. Is challenging beliefs and considering alternative explanations relativism? No, relativism is not uh, 
posing theoretical dilemmas. Relativism is adopting a position that there's no objective truth. When I try to criticize relativism, I get, you think you have the truth. You are narrow-minded. Yeah, but for them to say you think you have the truth is to make a truth claim. They're being narrow-minded. That's the response. <clears throat> Marius the Big Dum Dum, $10. <clears throat> hey, I took chalk. And I was actually able to understand some of your words. <laughs> also, deadlifts are better. Well, I was never telling you to replace weightlifting with supplements. I mean, do both, bro. But thank you for that, dum dum. Trent's going to get counseled five cents, five dollars. Thank you for everything that you do, Jay. Uh, could God be with you tomorrow? Trent doesn't know what's coming. Well, I think that it's going to be a good discussion. Um, Obviously, I haven't, <clears throat> I haven't laid out uh, my hand tonight. So maybe some of the topics that came up tonight will come up tomorrow night. I don't know. We'll have to see. But um, no, I have a lot of, we have a lot of big guns we're going to bring to the table tomorrow night. So um, yeah, look forward to that. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Ken Thoreau, $5. And he says nothing. Thank you. Dr. G's treadmill I think Dr. Gregor's treadmill technician, $30. I finally caught you live. Are you hyped up on chalk? I'm always hyped up. Uh, so absolutely, bro. So definitely uh, go get you some. I would like to thank you for all of the great content. Well, hey, thank you for supporting the great content. And thank you for that. Uh, yes, tomorrow night's debate uh, is in the community tab. So go over to my channel's community tab. Uh I'll put it in the show description here too. It's over on Intellectual Conservatism channel uh, by Suan Sona. If you haven't seen Suan's debate with Ubi, those are great debates. I highly recommend checking those out. Uh, and we'll be doing that tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 Central. And yeah, hopefully it'll be uh, a good thing. It, and it's going to be formal too. So <clears throat> there won't be this like half of a debate and then do whatever which Matt Frad had them do <laughs> it's going to be a consistently back and forth uh, formal exchange <clears throat> but um, one thing I do appreciate about uh, Trent is that he he's civil and he doesn't get you know angry he gets uh, you know you can get heated you can get passionate but uh, I think Trent is a good debater and and I don't anticipate him you know saying anything stupid or you know it's not gonna I don't think it's gonna devolve into name calling and being mean or anything like that i think it's going to be a great discussion and hopefully we can convey uh both positions uh, you know at least such that he understands what i'm saying even if he disagrees at least hopefully he'll understand it and i'll understand at least all of why he believes natural theology is the case and why it should be accepted uh i mean i've spent a lot of time studying and reading that you know proponents of natural theology and the Roman Catholic tradition. So I think I know the reasons why, but we'll let Trent give his reasons tomorrow. But anyway, thank you guys and everybody have a good night and uh, look forward to